<laughs> Let's see, should I leave meeting? <laughs> you see how this is already starting out. Yeah, I yeah. I should I put my tuxedo on? Wait, exactly. I, you know, I was like gonna... <laughs> this might this might be the longest podcast episode <laughs> ever in the his, history of podcasts. <laughs> but you can cut it down to about ten minutes. Exactly. <laughs> this is all he had to say that made any sense. <laughs> It was very interesting. Okay. <laughs> edit, edit. <laughs> well, that's the introduction to my podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Broadway Drumming 101 podcast. My guest today is the legendary Paul Pizzuti. I, you know, I don't even need to have an intro because there's so much that you're going to learn today on this podcast brought to you by the Oracle himself. <laughs> <laughs> look man well, i've been trying to i've been trying to get this guy on my podcast for like 17 years and i finally <laughs> got him on today so i'm not going to let him go you were a child when we you first contacted me it's amazing you know you were very mature for your age <laughs> ah man this is this is a dream come true did you know that Paul played with Parliament back in the day? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> <Cut. laughs> All right, Paul. You know the reason right. why the reason why I reached out to you is because I used to subscribe to Modern Drummer magazine for decades. And I had this issue that I kept for some reason. I don't know why. It's like one of the five that I kept, but it was June, I think, of 1981, and it had the Broadway drummer, it's Broadway Drummers Roundtable, and it had you, John Redsecker, Dorian McGee, and Mike Epstein, correct? Yes. And I was like, yes. man, why isn't anyone doing that in 2021? It's uh, 20 years, well, damn. It's, 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 the, it's a, I was about to say it's definitely years. a viable part of the business, Broadway yes you know, or, or a desired part of the business. Whereas in the past, I would not say it was, you know, thought of lightly or not seriously. It was, a, it was a job. It was a gig, you know, and it was, uh, you know, I mean, there are obviously people interested. You, for example, this is a very, very, very interesting uh, 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 endeavor that you've, you know, started here. And it's a lot of drummers want this to be part of their business model. I don't know exactly how to put it. I mean, it's, 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 it's certainly interesting in hearing people say, I want to play for a Broadway show. That's my goal. Yes. Like, yes. Oh, okay. No, I, I, I didn't think too much of that until I started playing for Ain't Too Proud and I got so many requests to uh, come and watch me play the show and mm -hmm. uh, and try to figure out, you know, how to get into the business. I'm like, man, there's so many young people that want to do this. And it's one of the reasons why I have this podcast is to give back and, and help people right. figure out what to do and what not to do. But again, I started back, <clears throat> excuse me, with the 1981 issue 40 years ago when I was right. very young learning how to play <clears throat> and I didn't really think anything about Broadway. I wanted to be a rock star. I still do. But mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, I'm not going to because my hair isn't long and I'm old and I'm a father and, you know, I can't do that. Plus, I have this gig. <laughs> Even though well, look, at the look at the stones. I mean, <laughs> they're old. They're fathers. They do have hair, though. But yes, they, but for whatever reason they have, that's another that's you know, who knows. You know, I can't I can't take Steve Jordan's spot. I you know who I'd like to play with. This is going out in the in the universe. Right. If I can play with Lenny Kravitz. Just, Lenny, oh, Lenny. Just yeah. Call me, yeah. Call me. Cindy Blackman. Who, yeah. Cindy Blackman Santana now, but she yes. was his drummer for quite a while, wasn't that's she? That's correct. Can Cindy yeah. just take a break? Can I just play with him for like a week? <laughs> Can I get it just a week? That's all I want. <laughs> but anyway, speak, I, yeah, I didn't think about Broadway right. until I, I fell into it. But look, you've been doing it for decades, decades. And I want to find out how you got started. What was your first show? Now, look, before we go, before we go on, 
Right. Paul has done so many shows. I mean, the list, I'm going to just read a couple. Tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. Merrily, We Roll Along, 1982. Yes. A Stephen Sondheim Evening. I don't know if that's a Broadway show or if that was a special. I'm not sure what that was. I don't know. Cats. You were the original drummer and the original. <laughs> yes. When I found that yeah. out, I was like, "Whoa!" Like, Bill sat- Lanham. When I, I, he, I met him recently, like a year or two ago, and he said, "I followed you in the drummer in the two shows that you did." And I said, "What? Cats and Evita, the revival of Evita." Too, oh, I, I done right. prior to Cats, prior to Merrily, I did Evita. The first Avita with Patty Lapone and Mandy Patinkin and Bob wow. Gunton and you know, just 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 to throw it out there. Uh, Assassins, crazy for you, big. Uh, yeah. Into the woods, uh, merrily we roll along. I said that before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kiss me, Kate. Mm. Both Kiss me, Kate's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was a revival that was just done. And many, many more, and we'll we'll go into that. But man, when I found yeah. out you did the original Cats, because I was subbing, <laughs> <laughs> I was subbing for Bill. I'm sorry for laughing. It's just yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. subbing for Bill. Mm-hmm. And people have told me about Cats, and I didn't understand anything about it. And I saw it in the audience. I was like, "What the fuck is this? <laughs> How did this last for so fucking long?" And then I it was a music. big deal. It was a big deal back then, in '82. Man, and I, it was a then big I, deal. I, I played the music, and I understand why it was uh, it, it it caught on because the music, some for some reason Andrew Lloyd Webber knows how to write a song that gets people to sing these songs over and over again, and remember them. And yes, yes, yeah, and and he, melodic, he, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, yeah. I get it. I still don't understand the show, even after seeing the movie. But we'll discuss the origins of that. <laughs> but look, man. <laughs> Do you remember the video? There was a video of a, of a guy saying how to play in 13-8. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and then at the end, fuck, don't play this shit. <laughs> You're not going to get paid if you play in 13-8. I don't know why that comes to mind. I'm thinking, what is it, 15-8? The Skimble Shanks was the tune <laughs> in that. And, you know, in Evita, he did the money gets come yes. rolling in in 7. seven and it's eight. like, why are you doing this? It's like, okay, it kind of works, but uh, you know, I mean, you know, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm just a drummer. I, yeah. I don't know. Hey, you he's know, making, he's making the money, and we're playing. As, <laughs> as someone has <laughs> said, and Andy, Andrew Lloyd Webber has been very, very good to me. <laughs> uh, you know, he, you know, seven years, man. Ron Tierno took over for me. Drum, great drummer. Hmm. He did the remaining eleven years. Wow. Yeah, so he's someone you should, you should talk to. Wow. Ron Tierno. Ron Tierno has been around, you know, a long time. Great drum, great musician. All right, speaking of being around, yeah, we're going to go yeah. back to the beginning. Sure. You were born where? I was born in Jersey City, New Jersey, across oh. the River Hudson, across from the Golden Towers of Manhattan. <laughs> And before you, they were golden, before they were golden. And when you were uh, growing up, did you say, you know what, when I get older, I'm going to work on Broadway. This is what I want to do for a living. How, you know, you're reading my mind <laughs> incorrectly, but you're reading my mind. No, I did not. Uh, I did not think of any. I had no career goals, per se. I started taking drum lessons when I was around 11. My mother asked my brother and I, do you guys want to play? You know, do you want to take lessons? And I, I think I've been, you know, pounding on pots or something. I don't remember exactly, but that comes to mind. It could be a false memory. I'm sure Russ Limbaugh, you know, just gone. <laughs> but uh, what's his name? Jones. Oh, Infowars. They would say it's all, it's all false flag. False, false you news. didn't remember any of this. <laughs> you weren't born in Jersey City. You Made in a vat out in the DARPA lab. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's good talking to you, Clay. Exactly. Um, Thank uh, you. Uh, Thank you. Hey, <laughs> we're cut, cutting this right now. Uh, once DARPA came up. <laughs> um, 
I, I she asked if we want to take lessons, and my brother said guitar, and I said drums, and we started taking lessons at the Sansone School of Music, the Vito Sansone in Jersey City, in Journal Square, which is a big hub yes. uh, in in uh, the Journal Square area where the path trains were, a lot of bus stops, station, a lot of stores, big mar- you know, a lot lot of department stores and such. When I was growing up. Uh, restaurants and he was located above the jade fountain restaurant which was a chinese restaurant up there and uh we started taking lessons and he actually had a recital at cammy i think it was cammy hall which is right across from uh carnegie hall i remember as a kid playing you know no big deal. Just like we studied with him for a few years. And then I went in high school and a guy I knew in my freshman class, was a trumpet player, I think. He uh, got me involved with a, a guitarist and an organist. I actually, I don't know how my drums were transported to this church. And we started playing. And eventually that you know, it was just fun to play. You know, I guess I guess I played well enough where it wasn't horrible. You know, I could keep time, and I guess it was songs in my head from listening to the. Uh, you know, I mean the the first the the first song I remember that really made me want to be a drummer also was "Sunshine of Your Love." Mm. I remember just hearing that on a radio one morning, one Sunday morning, probably had the radio on, and just that. Those the toms, the sound yes. of the drums. You know, never, never played any cream. I wasn't in any bands that played cream, but uh, just that was uh, pretty amazing. So this trumpet player is actually he's he's starting in a band or he's in a band where it's uh, I think it was him, another trumpet player, and a trombonist. And rhythm section, and they were starting to do some Chicago and different, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, uh, different things like that. And I replaced some drummer that they they uh, you know either didn't show up for rehearsals. What he was an older guy. This is all like 14, 15 year olds, you know. And that started my uh, that that was the beginning of the end, Clayton. That started my musical <laughs> career. <laughs> so you started, are you playing around Jersey City? Yeah, and, played course. dances, played dances around Jersey City, a little bit around the Union City, you know, this area. And we eventually expanded to, I guess it was like, you know, it was like a nine piece band at one point. All right. Know, we I had four. You- Four horns, yep. Go on. I gotta ask you a question about so, that. Yep. Uh back in those days, there yes. were big there were big bands. Do you remember how much you guys got paid? Were you doing oh, this for no. fun or was it like Oh know, no, 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 no. It was not fun. I mean no, I take that back. <laughs> it was it, was, it fun. was definitely fun. But we got paid. I mean, I don't remember. It was not uh, you know, twenty bucks a per a man, a person, whatever, mm-hmm. you know. Uh uh it was definitely more money than my mother, who was a widow, could give me in a, you know, an allowance. Mm. So, you know, I always had a little bit of money there once once I started playing. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I don't think we played every weekend. I don't remember. I think I blacked out or blocked out part of my life back then. But I do remember we worked quite a bit, you know. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, traveling, not a big show band kind of thing. But, mm. you know, as a matter of fact, the bass player from the band, I mean, I'm still in touch with many, most of these people. And he posted a poster from 50 years ago of a dance we did. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You, you, wow. Do you remember that yeah. dance? Uh, I remember the place. There was, it was Our Lady of Mercy. Catholic school, Catholic high school, Catholic high school, yeah, down in Jersey City, a portion of Jersey, section of Jersey City, and I can't remember the, the 
the the the priest who ran the dances was like a, a a curmudgeon and a drill sergeant. That's all I remember. It was like you can't do this, you can't do that. It was it was very, it was it was very funny. But we played had big hall, and usually there were two bands, one at each end of the hall, and wow. they split sets. You know, you know, it, wow. it was it was pretty wild. That was uh, you know, and, it, and other dances, various dances in different places. Yeah, you know, but that was. The poster, my, it was like, oh my God, man, that was, you know, I it was scary about, to see. I, I ask about the band thing because I always wondered how these bands back in this, really the, I guess the seventies when bands kind of got big, right. like Chicago, Earth Under Fire, right. Parliament, right. how did they survive? How did you, how do you get, how did, how did bands actually make a living with 10 members in the group? I guess the cost of living was a lot lower back then. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I don't know about Chicago or or any of the, the those bands. I mean, mm -hmm. Blood, Sweat and Tears were a lot of studio people. You know, I mean, they you know, they're professional bands. They that that's a different story. I'm talking about, you know, this is high school or playing, yeah, yeah. you know, like, you know, there was there was one band I remember from uh, there was this big, big public high school in Jersey City called Dickinson. And there was uh uh, Dickinson High School, and there was a band called World War Three. Jeez, that was just—it was just a quartet. It was like Led Zeppelin, and okay. they did a lot of Zeppelin and stuff like that. And they, you know, they played a lot. There were quartets that played. There's like when I played that 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 dance, that one dance at Our Lady of of uh, Our Lady of Mercy, which we played quite a few. But this, like I said, there was this one poster. I think we play opposite a group called Filet of Soul, S O U L. <laughs> and I think there were three or four singers up front and like a five or six piece backup band, you know? Mm. So there was, you know, people were not just doing it for fun. They were making some money. Mm. I mean, those, I think those were older guys, and I'm sure they worked a lot more than uh, high school students did. Did you, you know? uh, but I, I just don't remember. I, I don't remember doing things. It wasn't like now. When, oh, you want to do something for free? You know? right, <laughs> it's it's right. amazing how looking at time periods. You know, did you did you play strange. a lot in high school? I, I played a lot in high school and that got me, you know, uh, to. When senior year came around, it was like, well, I, I think I want to go to a music school. Now, I just a drummer. I had no mallet train, no nothing, no, no. So, I mean, Manus or Manhattan or Juilliard was kind of like not in the picture, you know, mm -hmm. at that point. But there was a local college, uh, which is now called New Jersey City University, I think it's called. It was Jersey City State College. That's what okay. it was when I went to it. And I auditioned and I just played some studies from a Haskell W. Har book that I learned that I'd learned from Vito Sansone when I went to the Sansone School of Music. Well, he's dead now, so I'm not pushing the Sansone School of Music. Uh, <laughs> above the Jade Fountain. No, and there's no Jade Fountain <laughs> restaurant anymore in, up in Jersey City. Uh, and uh, Nick Serrato was the, the professor there, a gentleman named Nick Serrato. And for whatever reason, he said, you know, the, the audition got me into school. Now, mm. that's, I guess it was fall or spring of the year before I went in, before the semester started. And I said, I'm going to have to, you know, he didn't tell me you got to do this, this, and this to, to, to get, you know, to be ready freshman year. But I had a friend who he traveled in the circle, the band circles. I mean, we, I, I, th this Jersey city band, we were, we had a lot of people from Bayonne were in our band, this whole area of Jersey city. There was two guys, <clears throat> two drummers that were fairly well, were working a lot. One was, I think his name, I, I think his last name was Clem Bazuski who became Clem Burke. Oh, yeah. Blondie. Blondie, yes. Yeah. And another guy named Phil Ramon, who 
uh, not not related Ramon? to okay. not not related to the to the Ramones. Phil, okay. Phil Ramon Phil. Shit, I can't remember his name. Oh, whatever. You you can. Doesn't matter. He was into Zappa, tremendously into Zappa. He was doing his Morris. Uh, they were four way coordination books. I mean, he had to be seventeen or eighteen. He had all this shit down, all a lot of stuff down. And he was auditioning to get into Manus with the eventual like goal of playing with Zappa. I don't think that ever happened, but, mm. and we've kind of, we've lost touch, but he gave me a couple of, he loaned me a small three octave xylophone and just taught me some scales so that I could practice scales. And I guess I saw the pattern and I was able to, you know, and I, I guess read a little bit to learn something of melody and harmony, you know, very little. And he gave me an Anthony Cerrone book, Portraits in Rhythm, that uh, he went through with me. So when I went back to college, when I started, you know, in my first lesson with Nick, and he says, oh, so what have, what have you been doing? I mean, he's kind of like, okay, let's see what's going on here. You know, I remember, oh, Haskell W. R. All right, he knows his fives and sevens and nine stroke rolls, and he knows how to play a flam. Let's see what goes in there. So I said, well, I, I worked through this book. And he said, he's looking at like the portraits and rhythm book. And he's saying sort of like, oh, really? Because he just saw me doing the Haskell W. R., which, you know, I, I, I'm... It's a simple book. It's a basic book. It gives you good, you know, the, the, to learn. It's great. But that compared to portraits and rhythm is like, you know, what, 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 are, you, what are you doing? This is all odd meter. This is this. It's, you know, a lot, a lot of tempo changes and, you know, technical problems with it. So he said, OK, well, what, what have you done in here? And I said, well, I went through the whole book. So he said, you know, he was like, OK. So in other words, if I open up to any page in this book, you're going to be able to play it. And foolishly, I said, yeah. And he said, OK. So he just like opens it up. And, you know, I, I can't say I played it perfectly. I guess I fumbled through it. But he saw that I, I understood what was going on. You know, whether it was odd meter or whether whatever, whatever the thing was, fortunes and rhythm, you know. So that started, he, he you know, I, 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 I just worked really hard and, you know, I did. He was uh, he got me started on Broadway, actually, after really? a couple of years. Yeah. I mean, like I did a lot of percussion ensemble, we were doing orchestra stuff. I mean, it wasn't uh, for, for me, it wasn't on the level of, of you know, the, the, the major conservatories. But I mean, it was like this was a whole new world to me, you know. And uh, I mean, I remember my mother was like, you know, I'd be gone from seven o'clock and I lived nearby. I, I lived close enough where I, I stayed, lived at home when I went to the school. And she was like, you know, you're leaving at seven o'clock and coming home at 10 o'clock at, at night what is going on she was like worried that i was into drugs or you know mm -hmm. she didn't know and so she came to a I, I guess the first percussion ensemble recital the, the the group and she and and surat mr serato just like you know calmed her down i mean she wasn't screaming or <laughs> that in him, but she said she saw that i was not wasting my time that i was mm -hmm. like you know, it, it, there was a purpose to why I was gone so long, you know. So, and you know, that, okay, so let's see. My, my friend Joe, the trumpet player, he started me on the road to perdition. Nick continued me on the road to perdition. You know, it's been down, I mean, it was downhill from when I was 14. <laughs> so this is just a continuation of that long slide, that long slide. I so then, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's listen, I, I, uh, it's been, a long time, man. Wow. All right, but going going okay. back to this this okay. time period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you heard "Sunshine of Your Love" on the radio. Yeah. Ginger yeah, Baker's yeah. drums pounding in that very unique yeah. form of that song. tribal African, very African. Yeah, which so, I didn't real, I didn't know at that point. By the yeah. way, speaking of Ginger Baker, did you ever see that documentary on him? Oh, <laughs> great. 
It was very, great. Very interesting. The, like, the best part I loved was when they had the old like map of the world. Yeah, and, and he every place, place he's that. been, what was burst <laughs> into flames. That was great. <laughs> Burning bridges. And then at the very beginning, went. when he smacks the guy with yes. his cane and breaks <laughs> his nose. <laughs> I forgot what it was called, but man, oh man, somebody said Beware of this. Mr. Baker. Yes. Beware of Mr. Baker. <laughs> yeah. And the way he wound up, I was like, man. Anyway. Well, he, he still was, thought he was the greatest drummer in the world until he died. Yeah, exactly. Know? I mean, he was, or not the greatest, but the greatest rock drummer or up there with Blakey and, and Max yeah. Roach. And that. Yeah. But other than speaking of drummers, who did you. Who, yeah. Who would you idolize back then? Who would you look up to and say, oh, my God, I would do that? Well, I liked, I, 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 I really liked Daniel Serafin from Chicago and uh, Bobby Columbi from the, uh, the first Blood, Sweat and Tears album. Don Brewer from Grand, Grand Funk, Funk Arrow. Yes. I saw Grand Funk three times. And I I really enjoyed that. Really, really enjoyed that. Although the first show I ever saw, first rock, first concert show I ever saw was at the Fillmore East. On Second Avenue? Yeah, the original Fillmore East. Well, the only Fillmore East. I, you know, yes. I, uh, three three bands. Jerry Hahn Brotherhood from San Francisco it was a jazz rock quartet, guitar, bass, drums, and keyboard. Opening for Blodwin Pig, which was an English band, which was B-L-O-D-W-Y-N, I think, Pig, which they were kind of ba- like, a, they were kind of a Jethro Tull-ish band with saxophone instead of flute. Mm. Opening for Chicago Transit Authority. This was before Chicago. I think they got sued. They couldn't call themselves Chicago oh, Transit wow. Authority because of Chicago Transit Authority. Yeah. I think that's the story. But but then they became Chicago, you know, yeah. after I think on the second album. I'm not sure. And that's the first show I ever saw. And that was that was great. That was great. You know, so a grand but but so a grand funk at Fillmore East, which was the best fucking show I ever saw in my life at really? the time. Wow. It, it was this trio. They just like, they, they were a perfect trio, man. You know, they were a Better perfect than cream? trio. I never saw cream. I never okay. saw cream. So, I, and when I look back, I like cream. And I, I, I loved that, you know, I, I will never forget that first feeling of hearing those drums and the whole the the, the, the sound of the guitar and bass that that mm. fuzzy do, 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 mm. da, da. Yeah. it was just something about grand funk that i really enjoyed that i really really enjoyed you know emerson lincoln palmer i got i i i went to see them two or three times too i liked carl palm a lot you know but did you um... that, that's okay that's changed over the years. Did you I was try? never a chops guy. I was never a big like. I loved Buddy Rich, but I didn't understand jazz back then. Mm. And although you know, I'm listening to Blood Sweat Tears, which is a jazz based group. Chicago is more rock, but it's a jazz based group. You know, but Buddy was like, you know, he, he was the master. He was like, you know, God, and he he still is. You know, uh, but. You know, not maybe not my cup of tea, but then all I, I, I usually say often, Clayton, like, who am I, man? If he's not my cup of tea, who cares that he's not my cup of tea, man? You know, well, I would go pay, if he came back now, I would pay to see him. <laughs> if Elvin came back, yeah, I would pay more to see Elvin, you know. Oh, uh, really? I saw Elvin once, I saw okay. Elvin once, and I didn't understand it. I saw him at the Vanguard, the Village Vanguard. Mm. And I guess I was in college. I must have been in college or shortly out of it. And he just did some, you know, he had like the four toms and the the floor tom 
was tuned lower than his bass drum. So it was just like, you know, where the fuck are the sounds coming from? I don't know what's going on. And he's doing this thing with triplets between the toms and he had mallets. And I, I just told someone, the other, I, I actually, I, 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 I just, I think when I met you and Bryn, I was going down to the West Bank Cafe afterwards to see Bill Hayes play. I've subbed twice, Ray Marchica's doing, he's, that's, that's his Friday night. That's what he does. I played this Friday night with them as a sub. And I'd done it once before that too. And Chip Jackson is the bass player. Now Chip and Bill played with Liza Minnelli for years, you know, in, in her, her, in her road band, her band. But he played with Elvin too. Chip Jackson played with Elvin. I mean, I don't know mm-hmm. what albums he's on. You know, it's, I mean, he's the second bass player I've worked with that has played with Elvin, which does that to me. You know, kind of like, oh, well, did, did you Neil Kane was the other one. Yeah. Did you ask, huh? him, uh, did you ask them about their experience? Oh, he's very verbal. He's very, I didn't have to ask him anything. <laughs> but th- th- Neil Kane is the other bass player. Neil plays with Harry Connick's band. And and the two shows that Harry Connick has done on Broadway, the pajama game, and he did uh, on a clear day, you can see forever, these two revivals. I, I did those with it. I also worked with Neil in, uh, what was that, that uh, Daniel Radcliffe was in, you know, How to Succeed, the revival of How to Succeed in Business. Mm-hmm. Neil played in that too. So Neil is, Neil's great. But Chip, you know, it's like, okay, I'll, I'll do this. You know, it kind of freaked me out to think that I'm going to play with this guy. And uh, this is kind of like a, you know, it, it, it's kind of a Gary Burton, Chip Korea sway. You know, the, the tunes are a mix of different things on this Friday night gig. But so I go there and, and, and you know, Chip, and, he, and he's like, we're, we're talking, introduces himself, or I introduce myself to him and like, He's talking about all the great drummers he's played with, like he played with Roy Haynes. He's mm-hmm. played with it. I don't know if he played with Blakey, you know, Elvin, obviously. And, and I, I, I don't know what possessed me to say. And I said, now you're going to play with Paul fucking Pizzuti. <laughs> <laughs> and he started laughing and he started yeah. laughing. Uh, and and we, we played it. And like, you know, for whatever reason, I, I, you know, I, kind of enjoyed myself as my wife said do you enjoy yourself and I said uh, maybe a little I don't know you know I I that's always did you like it uh, maybe a little you know, that's my <laughs> my attitude but it went and at the end of the night he said you know there was if I, he he's very I shouldn't say he points at him but he he's he's not he doesn't hold back you know she said well there's one tune where I I I just felt it was a little I, you know, off or something like that, or I didn't, I didn't like what you were doing. I don't think he put it quite in those words. And I said, I couldn't figure out what to do in that tune. You're exactly right. And it's just interesting that oh, he heard that. That's mm-hmm. very interesting. You know, out of all the songs over the night, you know. So last night I played with him again, and like he said, you know, I want to show you something. At the end of the night, was he plays the little drums, and it's like that. He, he said, any, no, any some people it? would be. And he sounded what? just like Elvin Jones when he sat down. He sounded just <laughs> like Elvin, a white, old, older, still living Elvin. No, he uh, and, and he sat down and he and he just did this thing. I don't know if we did a tune, a Mingus tune, nostalgia in Times Square or something like that. And he was just, which I didn't know before I started playing. And then it's like, oh, I recognize this note. But he did something, and and it was like. I said, yeah, Elvin would do this, and I said, how is he widening that backbeat so much? And it's like. Uh, Elvin showed me. Mm. So, so it's weird because he's playing the backbeat, but and he's playing dang, 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 dang. dang but the, the two and the four on the ride symbol are, it's more like with the backbeat, he's playing a, a flam. Hmm. The ride is not on two. It's like a nanosecond before two. Wow. And I, I, I still, I got to sit down at a set of drums and like just see 
if I understand what he was talking about. But I could understand the concept. But he said, that's what he was doing. And it took me a while to realize that, oh, that's why I'm hearing this wide two and four, you know, amongst everything else that Elvin would play, you know. But this was like, you know, when he's playing the two and four, he said, it didn't sound like a two and four. I mean, it just sounded, it had this really fat feel. Mm. <sighs> You know, so, so speak- it, 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 that was that was kind of fun to do that. That was kind of fun to do that, but play with him. So know? speaking of like influences <laughs> back in the 60s, yes. now you're not that much older than me, you're probably like five years older. I'm 55. I don't so. know. I'm 60. I'm 67. <laughs> All right. I'm 67. So. So I don't know. How old are you? 50, 55. You, 55. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's 12. 12 years yeah, old. I'm, it's I'm not. Like, it's not nothing, but it is, you know, it's not. <laughs> You know, it's it's. You know. Now, I was born in 1966, but okay, a lot of uh, some of the people that are older than me that I spoke to on this podcast talked about mm-hmm. the British invasion. Mm. Were you watching Ed Sullivan that day when the Beatles were on? And were you like, of course. Oh my God, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I want to be like Ringo. No, no, but I loved it. Mm. This is, I, I didn't feel like it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen because I didn't know. You know, I know it was different. It was really fucking different from the shit that y- you've been hearing. You know, it was different from the Beach Boys. I mean, I was listening to a lot of different radio at that time. But uh, um, my, my mom had usually W-N-E-W-A-M on which excuse me was basically the great american songbook most of the time you know it was all classic you know tony bennett frank sinatra ella fitzgerald uh, vic damone i mean all a mix of, of of most that and they didn't pay any play any rock but wnew fm that was the rock station and i used to listen to them too I used to listen to them too. You know, if I, I think I could get FM on my radio. So it was, uh, it was, it was, it was fun, but the Beatles, I don't remember. I was 10. I was 10 at the, when, when they, when they appeared. So I had to see it, but I do not remember it as being life changing. Hmm. You no, know? but at that point I was, I must've been pounding on pots and pads at that point because it was at 11. Mm-hmm when we started taking lessons so it was it was definitely there but i never played any beetle tunes growing up with any bands you know it was immediately you know like you know zappo was the i think the group i that group i was in in high school we did uh peaches and regalia one oh, of yeah, the, you know one, but that's the only zappa tune we did which it's the only zappa tune that was at least accessible yes. sort of accessible to a band you know, I'm not dealing with the, you know, yeah. the, <laughs> you know, the lines and shit. And it's like, good. Someone else is playing. All I got to play is two and four, you know, and, and, you know, the beginning, the, the intro coming into the two, you know, so I, I, I was never, I got to appreciate. Didn't get, didn't think Led Zeppelin until after into the into the 2000s then i started appreciating john bonham you know like mid 2005 2006 whatever when i realized what how many jazz influences he had Mm -hmm. with his playing you know i mean bombastic but still you know amazing i i don't love everything he's done i haven't heard everything he's done but i mean some of the stuff i listen to and it's like man he's like you know, it, 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 you know, like the immigrant song, which is like, you know, you hear it. It's just, you know, it's just in your face. Mm-hmm. But I'm sometimes I hear boom, boom, but that, the boom, boom, but that, the boom. I mean, if you slow it down, he's almost kind of playing the triplet in, in, in between. Boom, 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 boom. And, and yeah, you know, I'm exaggerating it, but it's like, Either I'm hearing it or I want to hear it or it's really there. You know, it's like listening to Black Dog. Mm. Jesus, man. It's 
like, how did he choose to play this shit? Yeah. I, I, how, how, you know, I would never choose to play that if I first heard this melody. First of all, I'd say, why are we doing this? You're right. <laughs> you know, I don't understand it. You know, I, he just like, you know, came out of the gate full. What was he, 20 when he mm -hmm. was Something in the like band? That. But he that was he was there already. It wasn't like he progressed. He was there at that point. Amazing. So, you know, you know, it's like Mel Lewis, Elvin Jones, R. Blakey, John Bonham. <laughs> you know, those are some of the people that I really, really, really appreciated and try to try to listen to a little more deeply. But, you know, you finished i'm sorry clayton where were we <laughs> no no i'm, I'm listening <laughs> it's yeah very, yeah 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 very interesting to to know you know who certain people grew up listening to and don yeah. brewer is not a name that you hear very often right and uh you know uh what's his name from uh chicago again danny Seraph. danny seraphine he seraphine he uh, was on the first few albums first right. I don't, I don't know when until it started becoming more of a pop pop yeah popish yeah. thing when just, terry kath the guitarist he died he yeah. self some weird self-inflicted you know gun thing or, uh, he I, was great you know yeah, I, I just remember hearing <gasps> vinnie Kalayuta talking about how he listened to danny and i was like man he uh vinnie <laughs> like looked up to him i'm like damn man, let me go back and listen to some of these records it's just interesting it's very him. interesting listening to him it's very interesting listening to seraphine because th th this group that i played with when i was a teenager we've still been in touch we actually played a 20th anniversary at our high school of music we used to do we did a 30th anniversary at our high school of and this was a big mistake. The bass player said, why don't we do songs that we all wanted to do, but we didn't do. Mm. And, and everyone thought that was a good idea until we realized we had to learn 20 fucking songs, mm. you know, all of a sudden, including, did you ever hear the group Dreams? Mm -mm. Oh. <laughs> that's a, that's a Billy Cobham. Billy really? Cobham. Yeah. Like Prior pre Mahavishnu. Really? Okay, hold on. Yeah. The Brecker brothers are in this band. I think Will Lee was in this band. Dreams. Check it out. But there was, well, they, they wanted to do one song of theirs called uh, New from York Lake, City. From 1970. Which, yeah, which is like an amazing tune. But I mean, the whole album is wild, you know. Uh, 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 so there was that to learn. There was... And as I saw the Pleasant Pheasant. Oh, that's interesting. Then I saw Billy Cobham. It's like, what the fuck am I learning here? So mm. it, uh, amongst all these other songs that all I remember is those two, because I think I blacked out because of those two songs. They were like really interesting to learn. Interesting, interesting to learn. Yeah, you know, but Dreams, you got to check out Dreams. Because they're like, you know, one of the seminal jazz rock groups that might not be that well known, but yeah. you know, not up there with like, I mean, Blood, Sweat and Tears or Chicago, D Dan Seraphine, he just like, I don't know, man. He He's not the greatest drummer in the world, but he played for that band mm -hmm. perfectly, perfectly. You know, I mean, it was, Bobby Columbia was more studio. I, I mean, more, he played great too, but it was a, a, a slightly different approach. You know, I, Seraphine, I, I almost felt like he was just like, I'm going to play anything I want to play. But mm. it's, it went with the melody. He, he accompanied things in the song. He did. And his time was there, too. But it was like it was more like more, more like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do this. <laughs> I'm going to do this. You know. <laughs> Columbia was cooler. Was a little cooler. Man, I think. <laughs> so, Edgar Winter, Edgar Winter, the huh. band I was in. We used to do a couple of Edgar Winter tunes. Give it everything you got. You know, uh, some really funky stuff. Some Buddy Miles stuff. Mm. Not we did them changes, which was like you know the big anthem. Mm. But he had there was a song called Easy Greasy. 
that, you know, really funky, really, really funky horns, lead guitar. And yeah, that's a, it's a great lead guitar and rhythm. So it's like you got that going underneath his horns and the lead. No vocals. I mean, in that it was just it was just an instrumental. But I mean, there was really great stuff back then. There were bands, you know. There were bands, you know. Were you, were you, as opposed to, were you yeah. playing in bands when you were in college too, or were you just concentrating yeah. on learning percussion and? <clears throat> yeah, okay. a little bit of money. Trying to, trying to, trying to, you know, you know, school was not that expensive. Also, because we were, uh, I, th I think, um, we had. Uh, survivor's benefits was my father died when we were young mm. so college was kind of paid if it was not totally paid it was not that much money i remember i remember i mean because it wasn't anything my mother i believe had to deal with but she's dead for 22 years now so i can't ask her but i don't think she was ever you know i don't think there was a money issue there. but i did we did did play with various bands through college you know definitely definitely when you graduated from college, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You, you want to say something? No, uh, it, you go. When yeah. You well, yeah. No, you, you go, please. When you graduated from college, did you uh, continue on with the various bands that you were in, or were you like, uh, did you know exactly what you wanted to do, or you just wanted to play music and make money doing it? I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was doing it. <laughs> I was just trying to get through school and play the stuff that I had to play. The future, as my wife would probably say, you, you don't, you're not a big planner. <laughs> I didn't have anything planned. Getting into college was like a surprise to me there. I mean, I was a good student academically other than music you know but i i mean a, a real i think it's i was in my third year of school and you know in college they have like okay your private lesson is one credit although you're 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 every day you're doing two or three hours on that this ensemble is three credits but you're still pre I'm in the middle of my third year and my general studies credits are like, I mean, I was going to be there for five years minimum to get out of school. I don't know if they still have it, but there, there's this test called the college level examination program, the CLEP test. You can get credits if you take this test, you know, and, and you pass in these subjects, in various subjects, you know, you could get general studies credits taken away from your, you know, to you to be used towards your graduation. So at Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken here, where I live, where I've lived for the past 450 years, where I've lived for the past since 1979, they had it one day. So I don't know, it wasn't a lot of money. I think you paid. And I went there and I got 21 credits added for that one day out of a possible 30 credits that you could add to general studies. And that got me out of college in four years. I wow. didn't have to because I, I was that far back with general studies credits. You know, I mean, what, what's the average for a semester? 18 credits, something like that, 15. So that helped me get out. Regarding what happens after college or what my plans were or what my thoughts were once again nick serato the music department and the theater department are doing a production of man of la mancha where he says we're going to do it like like it is on broadway which is not true he said we're going to audition for the chairs which is not true at all you know i mean maybe it's truer now than it was but it that didn't happen back then as far as i knew so I got the drum, I mean, there's a there's timpani, mallet, and a drum set chair, there's three chairs. And I got the drum set chair. And I don't remember the performances, you know, the rehearsals, the performances or whatever. But he 
said to me that I saw that you knew how to handle a conductor or you knew how to handle a show. So I'm doing Candide. Why don't you come in and look at it? Now, this is the Candide that Harold Prince was directing in the mid 70s. At, it was where uh, uh, Evita was, King Kong was, what is it, the, the Broadway Theater? On no, Bro- or the Winter yeah, Garden. On Broadway, like 52nd Street? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Where was Cats? At the Winter Garden, right? Cats was at the Winter Garden. So this was the Broadway Theater, the Broadway. So I came in to see it, and this is 75, 76. Theater in the round. The drums, there's only one chair. There's not a percussion chair. It's just a drummer. He's got a bass drum, snare drum, like a bass, hi-hat, ride cymbal, crash cymbal, whatever. One timpano, I think some bells, and a big gong under the bleachers behind him. Was people are set up. It's like bleachers. They're all set up around the center stage. Okay. And it's piano and bass there and the conductor. The band was in three other sections. And I don't think this is before, we're not even talking avions here. This is like, I don't think there was any speakers at all connecting the groups. Wow. And this is Bernstein, you know. So I see the show. I I don't even know back then if I, I don't think there were recording devices back in 76. I don't remember. So I play it and it's, it's, it, it, it's, you know, okay. Before the show's old, the show's ending. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. And he said, the conductor's going to start uh, the exit music, but then he's going to disappear. I said, what do you mean? Well, he wants to get to his car before the crowds get out. Now the exit music, Clayton, I mean, I don't know it well. <laughs> I, I'm never a classical person, but it's boom, da, 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 boom, da, 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 the overture to Candide. So I'm saying boom, da, 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 and he's gone. <laughs> and the band's, you know, it's da, 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 I mean, it's crazy. So the band plays it on its own. And that was my introduction to Paul Gimignani. <laughs> Wow. He was the con- he was the conductor who disappeared as soon as he could at the very end. That's He's just funny. like, hey. I think I'm gonna have to do that when I go back. Ain't too proud. Oh, Next Saturday, our open reopening night. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'll do the uh, Benny Benjamin fill. <laughs> One, two, I'm out. See you. See you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or just like click, turn the little recording. Yeah. <laughs> Problem? What's the problem? <laughs> exactly. It's, problem. It's, it's in time. So he so I, I did that. I subbed and then I actually took over that chair. Nick and uh Eric Cohen, who were splitting the chair. Eric, who's been one of the percussionists in uh uh what is the thing with the guy with the mask? Uh Phantom yeah. of the Opera. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Since the opening, he's been what well, this, this guy Rick Cohen has been in that show playing it, but he and Nick left to do a show called "I'm Coming Home, Homer," about the Odyssey, starring mm. Yul Brenner. Mm. That basically opened and closed, but they left. So I started to I I finished it with another uh, uh, one of Nick's students, Elizabeth Vakowitz, who. I've gotten out of touch with. She was a great percussionist in school. And there were other, well, I mean, it, it, it through school, got, there was a guy, there was a student there who was friends with a drummer named Mike Redding, who passed away in the early 80s, I believe. Mike was doing Godspell on Broadway or Off-Broadway, which was up at the Promenade Theater, which was in the 70s on Broadway. And I started subbing for him. So now I'm out of college, Candide's closed. I think I'm doing subbing for Mike. They decide to move down to Broadway. 
Now, this is 77, 70, whatever. The 50% rule was nowhere even in the vicinity yet. Mm -hmm. So Mike tells me, listen, I have to, I just told the contractor, I have to take off like 11 times in the first month. So if you want the gig, it's yours. That's how you got the so game. So I did it for about a year and a half on Broadway. I played it for a year and a half on Broadway, you know. Oh, okay. What was the show again? What? Godspell. What was... The original Godspell. Wow. That was yeah, with yeah. Stephen 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 Schwartz. Stephen Schwartz. Stephen Schwartz. So you were the original I... drummer on Godspell. No, I was not the original drummer. The original on Broadway I was. But the original drummer who was on the album. There's an album. I think it's Ricky Shutter, his name is. Now, why did he do that? The, the album and not you? Well, oh, because I wasn't there at the beginning of the show. The show, the show had been running. I Mike was playing it after Ricky left, I guess. Oh, okay. okay. I don't know. You know, Ricky opened it. He did the album. I don't know what his history with the show is, but Mike, Mike Redding was doing it, and I subbed for him. And then, you and then he started. couldn't do, you know, he, he couldn't live up to the uh, the obligations that the, uh, you know, the contractor wanted. So I was there. I did that for like a year and a half. Okay. Out of the year and a half, do you remember how many times you took off? Oh, accident, maybe a handful at that. Really? I was there. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, I think I took a vacation, but, but uh, I don't remember exactly. I remember Warren or somebody talking about they would, the contractor would tell you when you could take off. Yeah. You know, that was it it was sort of like that. It was sort so of like that. Happened, I don't remember. Did you so you had subs, like Warren would say, you had yeah. subs, but they weren't really in very much. No. No. Fascinating. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I remember the I played the show, there was a the big blackout in New York City. Oh my god, that's right, in seventy seven. Yeah, Ooh, I, man, I, I, that, that? I, w I was there, Yikes. and the band was set up on two platforms on either side of the stage. On one side was the keyboard player, the musical director. He had a piano and an organ up there, and it was guitar, bass, and drums on the other side. Power goes out. Generators come on. It's like the audience, do you want to leave, or do you want to, you know, we can do it acoustically. So I play, I just played congas instead of drum set. The guitarist played acoustic. Really? I think the bass player picked up an acoustic and played that. Yeah. 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 That was so yeah, I blocked yeah. that out, Clayton, for so many years. I didn't remember <laughs> I was that's there. So interesting. You know? Yeah. Now, the blackout in 77, it turned just like a lot of things can ugly. In, yeah. in those kind of situations. Now, when you walked out of Times Square, 1977, <laughs> you were like, oh, man, let me get back to Jersey. Isn't this nice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, let me get the fuck out of here. A friend of mine, <laughs> uh, an actor who I worked at his cabaret act. For some reason, I had the keys to his apartment or he'd given them to me or for something for an emergency, whatever. And I actually had a few friends who had come to see the show that night. And his apartment was on like 43rd Street between 8th and 9th. And we just went to that apartment quietly, as quietly as possible through all the mayhem that was going on. And we stayed there that night. Yeah, so it was it was a weird night. It was a weird night. But I, I, I don't remember personally being involved in it there were no situations you know we just you know even then i know i knew just keep moving right just right. keep moving you know, a, don't I stop have... and say wow yeah, exactly you know <laughs> why you're ripping that great up wow really yeah you know, yeah don't so just I, I just I, I keep hearing stories of new york city back in the 70s and 80s i got here yeah. in 93 look it, yeah. it we if Things don't turn around. We might go back to the seventies and eighties. <laughs> Sooner, you know, I don't know when this is going to be released. Hopefully, before our current mayor is gone. But uh, sooner, he, sooner, as soon as the sooner he leaves, the better. But New York City back in the seventies was a, was a mess. But yeah. 
uh, people came to see Broadway shows. I I just heard stories that people would f- would come from out of town. That there was a a campaign back then called you know I Love New York and you know oh yeah they had yeah, that yeah. great song and my mother used to sing it all the time and we didn't go to yeah, New yeah. York even though we never yeah. did. <laughs> but Frank Langella, Frank Langella, he, he, was on, he was in Dracula on Broadway at that time, and the very end of that commercial was like you know. I love New York. And then it, it, he appears looking at the, you know, in the full cape, everything. Mm. And he was a very handsome guy at that point. You know, he's very charismatic, mm. especially in the evening. <laughs> but just perfect. Watch out. Just don't perfect. Man. Oh, man. Perfect. Yeah. Well, you know, watch so, out for bats. <laughs> but I heard that, you know, I don't know how true this is. You can tell me what it was like. People would go to their, you know, they get into the hotel or the, uh, what's yeah. it called again? That Plaza World, oh, uh, Worldwide Plaza. No, not no, no. Plaza. That was that was Worldwide Plaza was a it was, parking lot when I early really? on. Really? Wow. Oh yeah, it was just a parking. It was a giant that from ninth to eighth was a parking lot. That's that was crazy. a parking lot, man. Fiftieth and fifty first, ninth to eighth parking lot. Weird, man. Yeah, it's yeah. Big building now. There was a, a hotel. That was like right around the corner. What was that called? It was like the fam- one of the famous hotel. Anyway, I don't remember. It would go to their hotel and then run right. to the show and then <laughs> run back to the hotel because Times Square was such a mess. But was it really that bad? And people talking about yeah, people having machetes and you just gotta watch out for the pimps and the hoes. And- I, 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 maybe from growing up in Jersey City, I just like, mm. I just kept moving. I went where I had to go. I did not see that much main craziness. Although I've been in, you know, the music building down on yeah. uh, between 30 and 30. I've been there since the mid eighties. Mm. And I remember seeing some people chasing it with knives on 8th Avenue in front of the place. Damn. And the building was always, you had to make sure everything was locked, you know, which was, you know, standard operating procedure in general, but it was like the building was funky, you know. The neighborhood, once again, I would just, I mean, I grew up in Jersey City, not in a, a rough area, but I was going into Manhattan since I was an early, you know, a teenager, young teen, 13, 14, I don't know. And I go to the village, uh, you know, I uh, don't really remember having to go, going uptown for much of anything, you know. You know, but the village to just uh, to to drink at bars that would let me drink at 15, you know, and or to go to the Fillmore or to go to the Palladium. I think that was another big, uh, uh, big club like rock club. I mean, the, I think the Palladium in the pro- past was like a big salsa place, like Latin bands. But there was did a lot of to, rock concerts on 14th Max- Street, I think. It was. Yes, huh? 14th Street. Did you ever yeah, go to, to Max's, Max- Max's Kansas City? I went to Max's once and I saw the Ramones, yeah. you know, which I don't remember who else is on the bill, but all I remember is like count offs. Exactly. <laughs> it was Every hilarious. Song. What do they want? <laughs> and and one the- time the sound went out. So like whoever, D- 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 Joey, went, what do they want? And then you know it got started, and he he counted off again, and the power went back on. Or something the thing like about that. those, those that <laughs> he would count off those songs in one tempo, and then the the song oh. would be in a completely different tempo. Oh, oh. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I I played at CBGB's once, hmm. one time, which was really interesting. A group <laughs> of the, a, a, a local band in Hoboken called the the names, you know. Band names are great now. They were great back then. But this was like the young Hegelians. Hegel. Hegel. Wow. <laughs> it was a trio. And I knew the, the guitarist, the, sort of the bass player, I knew the drum. The guitarist calls me up like on a Monday and says, we're playing the CBGB's Friday. Jim is in London. He can't get back. Can you learn our songs and play with us? Hmm. <laughs> so I learned 10 or 12 young Hegelian songs and did a rehearsal or two and it was fine. That day I played with a group of a, a group I had been playing with 
uh, uh, called Mixed Grill. We did like Brazilian and Latin stuff. We played at a party at the Museum of Modern Art or the Guggenheim, somewhere uptown. And then I drove down and played at, at CBGB's later that, that, that night mm. and did a set. The sound guy was like, I had a snare drum, a Gretsch snare drum that I bought. A friend of mine found them at a, at a flea market. And he called me up. He said, I've got, there's a bass drum, a snare drum, a cymbal. The bass drum says G-R-E, buy it. It was like $15, some shit, wow. the crazy price. And the snare drum I had redone by Tim Herman at the old professional, uh, I don't know if he was in, Joe, not Joe's, I can't remember. He was in the professional percussion center, which was back on 8th Avenue between 50th and, and 51st Street. It was, that was, I think, way before your time. But uh, And he was like a master technician. But he put a couple of extra air holes in it. And I don't remember what kind of snare mechanism. And then the sound guy at CBGB said, that's the loudest snare drum I've ever heard. And I'm thinking, this is CBGB's. <laughs> this wow. is the loudest snare drum he's ever heard. And, but it was a, it, it sounded great at low volume, it rolls. It a, but he said it was the loudest snare drum. So that's my CBGB story. Because it was coming from you, your 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 sticks and your hands. Well, also the the accelerants that I brought on the way down between the Museum of Modern Art job and the (laughs) CBGBs. It was it definitely (laughs) sound. Yeah, it enhanced the sound, enhanced my driving, enhanced so many things, you know. You know, no accidents, no accidents. But that's that's all accelerants, that's gonna be anything, right? Exactly. That could be that could be anything. Coffee. A lot yeah, of coffee. Yeah. I had a lot of coffee. Yes. Yeah. It was illegal coffee, but it was a lot of coffee. Okay. <laughs> 1977, so, Godspeed. Yeah, yes. You're in, you're in the middle of the, the forefront of new theater and, and things are changing. Yep. yep. People are like, what the hell is this hair shit and Godspell? And ah, let's go back to and Annie and, and uh, American in Paris and but you probably did all that stuff. Anyway. <laughs> no, I didn't. I never did any. I never did American. I never did well, a lot of classic. Did yeah. or, Warren did it. Warren, listen, Warren, Marchica, uh, uh, there, yeah. there's a lot of, I, I mean, Nick Serato is like older than I am, but he was like in there at that time too, playing, you know, a lot of shows. There's a lot of guys. I mean, we are, we are you know, I'm I'm fortunate to, you know, to have, you know, I look back and it's like, holy shit, man. Well, well, you know, I'm still alive. And number two, I've done all this stuff. It's like. It's it's pretty amazing that you've had a career since 1977 doing shows and, you know, (laughs) testament to your, your ability and your, 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 you know, the gifts that you bring (laughs) to the community, but just seriously, your, your talent and, and obviously you you know well, what you're doing and you've you've you're very experienced doing it and to maintain a career doing this it's not easy at all and you keep getting calls which is pretty amazing so you got the Godspill thing you and that ran for a year and a half correct approximately yeah I I I, I don't remember yeah. it precisely but did you go right okay. into another show right after that no I I started subbing I subbed for uh, I I subbed at Barnum a show called Barnum, which John Redsecker, who, you know, you know of, that's what he, he, he did. It was a psych, I think it was a Cy Coleman show, Barnum. The band was set up flush against the back wall in a row. And at certain times you had to go out and play marching drums with a group, for, you know, which was a circus show. I said for that, I didn't really, you know, I, 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 I don't remember it too well. I kind of blacked out at that time. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. But I said they are something they're playing our song, which was uh, Mike Keller was the drummer. Mike Keller, the contractor, was <laughs> really? the drummer. Okay. Yeah. And Jim Ogden was the percussionist. Now, Mike and Jim, the, the, the studio I'm in in the, in the music building is called the Black Hole Studio. It's called the black hole because in the old built 
th- this was the second iteration of the black hole. The original black hole was on 7th Avenue near 50th Street. All the windows were covered by black drapes. So it was called the black hole, you know, black like theater curtains to cut down on sound and just to, you know, that was it. Uh, so I subbed there at, at, at those shows. I, I don't remember if I subbed at anything else at that time. And then I, I, I mean, I guess I was working en- enough where I was like, I, I don't think I was living home. I think I was splitting an apartment with a guy. And Paul Gemignani calls me up and says, you know, now this is, this is right before Evita is opening on Broadway. And I've been looking at Evita commercials, you know, for months, you know, they, they were like, you know, pushing, you know, Patty LuPone or Elaine Page, whoever did the London thing, you know. So he says, they're having a little trouble with the, at, 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 at the, with the band, with the drummer. Uh, and said, why don't, this is like a Friday. Can you go down tomorrow to the Broadway theater? They're going to do a rehearsal in the, in the uh, morning and then they're doing the Zitz probe in the afternoon. And he said, and just talk to the conductor and, you know, just, you might, I can't promise you the gig, but just talk to him and tell him what you've done. And so I'm like, okay. You know, I was young, foolish. I said, fine. Right? I'm playing a job by Newark airport that night till like three o'clock in the morning. I get home about four. Now I looked kind of like someone from the one of the San Francisco bands or Grateful Dead. I had this this was brown or black. This was darker. <laughs> and I looked like Jesus. I mean, my hair was like, you know, I so I go there around 9:30 and I see this guy really bald. He's got a few medallions, his shirt is open like that, very stylish, you know, dress pants, lovely Italian loafers or something. And he's setting up stands and he's like, and his name is Rene Wigert. This is the conductor. And I introduced him. So, oh yeah, Paul told me about it. Why don't you just go sit over there and you know, we'll talk at lunch? I was like, okay. The drummer comes in and he immediately he's he's got two floor tom toms. And I'm saying, Wow, you know, what limited experience I've had on Broadway. That's weird. You know, I haven't seen two floor tom toms. Yeah, well, he didn't need them. That was his drum set. And now, Evita is like stop, start, new tempo, this tempo, this meter, this, blah, blah, blah. So they are, you know, I don't have the music in front of me, but I'm listening. And they're stopping every couple of minutes because of him. And I could tell that. And so I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on at that point. So I go out to lunch with Renee and uh, Andy Schwartz, who uh, the, uh, he's one of the union officials. He's been a union official uh, for quite a while. And a guitar, he's one guitar. And Steve Usher, they had two guitars at the show. And I mean, I wasn't like, Renee, I really want to do this. And I've done this. I've done, I just, you know, told him what I've done. You know, I, I mean, I did Godspell and I've been sobbing. At the, and he said, okay, you got the gig. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I didn't say what. <laughs> I said, okay. But yes, and thank you. So why don't you come back and listen to a little of the sits bro, but I can't give you any music to look at. And, but tomorrow, why don't you come here at 10 a.m. with your drums? Because, I mean, they're definitely firing the guy that afternoon, but he had to play the Zitz Pro because there was no drum, you know? And thank God they didn't say, go in and sight read it, you know? <laughs> You're the drummer. Oh, really? Go in and sight read it. You might right. as well, you know? So I said, you know, thank you for small favors. So I couldn't get the music. I've got the gig. I've got another nine to three at a bar at Newark airport that night. So 
so I leave the Zitz probe is just like, I'm listening to like a few minutes and it's like, I, I don't need to listen to this. This isn't helping me at all. You know, listening. To this. I go to Colony, the music store that used to be on 49th and, and I buy the British Evita, the only album out. And I listen to it about a dozen times before I go to my 9 p.m. gig. And 16-year-old Simon Phillips is the drummer on the album. Wow. Simon Phillips. You can, you, can, you, can, you can double check that, but that's what I, be I believe it was. You know. And I'm listening and I'm saying, oh, shit. Now, I don't have the music. I'm just listening to it. And it's making sense, but I don't have the music in front of me. And it's like, oh, I listen to it a lot. I do my gig, pack up my drums, leave my drums in the car, you know, which in Jersey City was a, you know, was a, an iffy proposition. Like, oh, did I bring them in? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I get there in the morning. I set them up. It's me and the piano player and Renee. You know, as this close conducting me. Hmm. And I'm sight, I'm sight reading the music. I guess I didn't fuck up, you know, I guess I got through it, you know, which was a thousand percent improvement over the performance that they had dealt with. The orchestra comes in, I, I'm in the pit that afternoon with doing a sound check or minimal sound check. I mean, it wasn't crazy back then. Monday is there's, there's a rehearsal in the afternoon and we opened Monday night. <laughs> You know, I, I, I mean, it was it, it 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 just goes to show you. I mean, I mean, back then, I I know was it Warren or someone said, you know, you'd go see a show and you'd come and play it the next day. You know, back then with the musical, you know, and, and that's basically what happened here. You know, it's like I didn't even see the guy play the show. You know, I I I just like here's the music. I'm going to just like try to keep my place and play the groove, you know, even if the groove is not clear. I mean, I, I don't know if I read it 100 percent accurately, but I mean, I kept my place. And when he needed to move somewhere, I moved with him. Mm. So so that's Renee Wigger. Renee was doing it. now. Paul was the contractor, the outside contractor for cats, for cats. I'm sorry, I'm I'm. I'm moving forward he mm -hmm. was the he was he got the band together for evita you know he was like uh, uh uh you know like red press or john miller or or mike keller mm -hmm. yeah. so he comes in after a year to take over and then a while after that merrily we roll along is coming in and he asked me to leave to go do that and I go do that. It opens and closes. I mean, now it's a it's it's a semi classic, I guess. One of his shows that people say was an you know, uh, it was more of a gem than it than it was at the time, or it was more understood now. Whatever you know, I don't know. The music was was good, and the band was great. The band was great. And that closes. I'm, I'm back at subbing. Renee calls me up now. This is just, I mean, these are just these connections, mm -hmm. Clayton. It's like, it's nothing different from now, but this is like my, my connections. So Renee calls me up and says, hey, I'm doing uh, uh, two weeks of a show called Red Hot and Cold, which, you know, was a Cole Porter musical at the Michael Bennett studio, which was 890 Broadway. That used to be Michael Bennett used to either own that building or, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure what the business aspect of it was, but there was a theater in the first floor. Two pianos, bass and drums. And Renee, Renee's playing one piano. And I don't remember the name of the other pianist, but they were having a jolly old time. It was great. It was fun. Bass player was a guy named Harry Max, who I haven't seen for 50, you know, back then. And I'm playing drums. Uh Renee says, Paul, I'd like to introduce you to the musical director, uh, Stanley Lebowski. 
So, hi, Paul. Hi, Stanley. Nice to meet you. We shake hands. Never see him again for those two weeks. I mean, I guess he would dance dealing with the cast. And Renee was, you know, th- those guys had it under control. Let's put it that way. You know, there wasn't any micromanaging. So I don't remember. We were doing a call Porter tunes. And I guess even at, you know, I was late 20s, I guess I figured out what to play. Not, I mean, I wasn't like a, a stylist of playing that music. I mean, I just, I don't know. I played it well enough. Got through it. I guess it swung up to a point or as much as Broadway can swing or whatever, you know. Uh, so I finished that. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Here's the checks. Great. Don't remember what I'm doing for a while. I can't remember back then exactly, you know, day to day. Didn't have a show. I knew that. Mel Rodman calls me up. I get a phone call. Now, Mel Rodman was a pretty, you know, he was, you know, the John Miller or the Mike Keller of his day. He was a contractor. So he calls me up. And I'll, I'll never forget. It's like, hi, Paul, this is Mel Rodman. I don't know you, but Stanley Lebowski asked me to call you for Cats, who I met. Hi, Stanley. Hello, Paul. And I played for two weeks. That goes back to like, you never know who's going to be listening to you. I got, I worked for seven years because of those two weeks. Wow. You know. So he called you up. Call me up. For you. Gave me the gig. Yeah, but but the fr- first thing was, it's like, oh, Paul, we want to do a, 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 a recording of a tune of Stanley's. And it was me, Dave Katzenberg, the bass player who did the show. And I'm not sure if Ethan Fine, the guitarist, did it. But basically, that was my audition. I didn't know that was an audition, but I basically wanted to see if I was going to fuck up the session or not and not play well. So, you know. Went downhill from there. I didn't fuck <laughs> it up. And then seven years, man, of cats. Seven so, years of cats. Did you know anything about the show? Did you think it was, you know? Nope. Really? Nope. Other than, well, I mean, it was big. You know, you know, it, this this was this was a bigger deal than Evita. You know, I mean, Evita had all this press coming into it. Now, why know? was cats bigger than Evita? Because it was a unique. I guess people. I guess people like like. <laughs> Like, like animals more than dictators. I don't know. I don't know. You know, because of the hype. Because of the hype. Look at all these like men and women in these slinky costumes and everything. Mm. Now, I didn't see the, the 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 movie. Did you see the movie? Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I, I think the movie. I gotta see it one day. I gotta see it one day. You the know? movie Just made the... more sense to me than the show. Okay. I can, okay. I kind of understood. What was kind of all about? Okay, okay. yeah, the, the the show. Unless you know, I mean, it's like it's like looking at modern art when you have to read an explanation of what you're looking at. Mm. Then it's like okay, or listening to avant, really avant garde jazz. It's like, I, 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 I what? I, right. you know, I don't, you know, the liner notes. It's like, uh, uh, okay, I mean, I don't need to read the liner notes to listen to Hank Jones. Right. I understand what Hank Jones is doing, you know. So, uh. And that was so that, that was, was 1983, 82, October 82, a month okay. that will live in infamy. <laughs> well, before 82, <laughs> you were yeah. asked to be part of the modern drummer Broadway. Round oh, <laughs> yeah, that was during Evita. That was during Evita. Now, why did they pick? Do you know why they picked you for the four of you? Well, isn't it obvious? <laughs> Uh, because we were young drummers, I guess. I don't know. All of us were, I guess, around the same age, you know, and we were all doing successful shows. Mm. I, I don't remember. All I remember is, I think, once again, it was Gemignani saying, you know, Modern Drummer is going to call you up. I guess they called the public publicity office. Mm. And he said, I want you to do it. And I said, all right. And you all so four were were around a table and I yeah we were sitting I, at a table when I spoke to John recently he's like yeah I think back then I was uh I was smoking a cigarette wasn't I and I said yes yeah. he was <laughs> yes he was yes he was <laughs> and I remember Dorian who I didn't know from Adam before then and I never saw again after that day 
Wow. Was was basically the first question, what's the most important thing? Get there on time. I yes, think he, that did he said that. something like that. Yes, and I thought at the time, I thought, God, that's you know, trite. That's simplistic. It's like, no, no, it's not. <laughs> and it's so true. You gotta be there, you know. Then you go from there, you know, but you gotta be there. You know, yep, it, the, it, was a it weird... says this. What are the elements necessary to be a successful Broadway drummer? Dorian McGee. Dorian McGee, right? Uh, mm-hmm. That's his name? Yes. He said, mm-hmm. be at the gig on time. <laughs> as far as okay. being a successful drummer, as in any other business, being on time. Right. Did I say Dorian Hayward? That's an actor, isn't it? No, no. You said yeah, Dorian McGee. Also, McGee? I got I, I, I to gotta read this because I, I, I think I read this to John Redsecker. Dorian yeah. said, uh, I consider myself the pulse of whatever show I play. Although conductors conduct, you can't hear anything but the time. You hear us. Depending on how you feel, the show can be great one night or it can be, you know, if you're tired or whatever, you can bring that into the pit, which I try not to do. Basically being aware. Also, people come in and pay $30 for <laughs> top price tickets. Right. <laughs> and I read that. I was like, $30? Yeah. yeah. God yeah. damn, you you know, thirty dollars is what you'll pay for a, a bottle of water nowadays <laughs> at, at a Broadway theater. <laughs> True. Oh man, True. that was so funny. No, but that, that good I mean, that's you know, I mean that that's very similar to what many people have said to you. Yes. You are you're running the show. You have to be supportive of the conductor. You have to have the conductor believe you're on their side yeah you know that they understand you know if they're doing something weird or what looks odd you have to be able to interpret that you have to be able to interpret that i mean you know i i've been to some shows where as a sub and looked at the conductor and basically said to myself oh my god how am i gonna do this but this was later on where it was the walkman or something where you could learn the show. You, you, I mean, I basically most shows, I, I, I can't say most shows, every show I subbed at, I memorized, you know, so that when I was playing, I'm looking right at the conductor, you know, and say, I'm going with what I'm hearing or what the band is playing. I don't understand what he or she is doing, maybe, but. I understand that that doesn't matter because I am giving them what they want. You know, I mean, they, the, the, as a sub, uh, who said this? Probably most people. You don't want to be noticed. You want, you at the end of the show, it's like, oh, X wasn't in tonight? You sounded great. You know, I didn't even know he wasn't there. That, happened to, that happened to me once. Check. Uh, That's what you want. When no. I was subbing at Motown, mm-hmm. uh, a trumpet player came in and he's like, he wanted to talk to Buddy. He's like, hey, Buddy. It's like, and then he saw me. Mm-hmm. And that's a compliment. I was like, oh, thank you. Yeah. I sounded like Buddy. Good enough yeah. so that you thought it was him. Yeah. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm only laughing because I subbed for Buddy at Hello Dolly, the, the last, the, the Hello Dolly. Mm-hmm. And that was like, I'd never really met him. Before. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, we it's two different worlds. I mean, he's yes. recording and touring, and right, and he's right. one of the he's one of the gods, man. I don't know. Yes, you know, he he's is. he's been around forever. Yes. And still, you know, still, still around, still playing, still working, mm-hmm. still doing, you know, amazing, amazing stuff. But um, that was wild. Watching him play "Hello Dolly," yeah, and I like didn't, I didn't see okay. him play that. I just, you know, know him playing the the groove stuff. I don't yeah. know what it was like playing that. He groove. was grooving. He was grooving at "Hello Dolly." I mean, he really? was playing the right. Oh yeah, he was playing the right For stuff. Sure. I mean, you know, a, a few things. I was like, I, 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 just to myself, it would. I, I would say, I would never think of doing that mm. in this tune. But it worked and there was no, there was no, nobody was questioning it. Right. Weird. Music, the music business is weird. 
conductors, so, contractors, producers, stars. Yeah, it can be weird. You know. Spe- yeah. Speaking of weird, let's go back to cats again. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. It's, so, it's I've I've almost worked my way out of you know out of all the all the now my it, deep deep dark feelings about it. It was a uh, <laughs> you know that show. I tell a story when I came to New York in 1993. I was okay. just eager to meet people. And I was walking in the Times Square area and I saw okay. this person with a look like a saxophone case on their back. And I was like, excuse me, yeah. my name is Clayton Craddock. I just moved to New York City. i uh, just like to introduce myself and meet some musicians. And I mm-hmm. wonder, you know, what do you do? He said, he said, yeah, I work at uh, Cats right here at the Winter Garden. Okay. I was like, uh, so what's that like being in a Broadway show? He's like, oh, man, you don't want to do this, man. It's like a job. I was like, oh, OK, thank you. Yeah, it's a job. <laughs> I didn't want to do a goddamn job. I wanted to be a rock star, man. I didn't realize that you can have a job playing music that you can either you love it or you don't love it, but you can play music and be a musician and make money yeah. and get a pension and health insurance, stuff that you don't think about when you're 20 oh, yeah. or, or 25. Well, how, I forgot 27, however, however yeah. old I was. But, um, uh, yeah, he yeah. kind of like scared me away from Broadway for like seven years. Well, <laughs> I didn't think about it until the year 2000 when I got a, a bus and truck tour and I started making money playing a show. And I was like, wait a minute, this Broadway thing is kind of interesting. But um, you did yes. that for seven years straight and then you you went on to another show. Now, you left that. Why? Well, Why would you leave well, something well, so secure? I had said to uh i remember at one point in the first year or two say leaning over to dave katzenberg who was right in front of me the bass player and saying i got i got five years in me i don't think i can do this more than five years and at the end of the seventh year i was kind of burnt out from it maybe i was maybe i don't know I took, I remember I took a leave of absence for three months at one point, and I actually played in a percussion ensemble, but it was more a, a, a groove thing. I was playing congas and timbales and different things like that. And that was kind of a lot of fun. I remember coming back and like the second day I was felt as heavy and depressed and weighted as wow. I did before him yeah i mean there there were there were some problems in the band friction between certain players and it it wasn't helping me at all i i don't want to get into it more than that because right. it is still a loaded thing with me you know yeah, I hear because that. i realize it now as an older musician that Sometimes I just don't want to hear some young players not doing what I think is supposed to be done. It just could be a bad, an attitude thing. I, I don't know, but it's just, I realize, oh my God, this must have been so much of a problem to certain people back then. It's over. It's over. So I left to do, I did Three Penny Opera with Sting. I did not just cut out the show period i left to do three penny opera with sting which only lasted about two and a half months it opened and closed yeah wow. it was weird it was really weird and it was with the orchestra of saint luke's that was an orchestra that that part of them did it you know i guess it's like a 20 piece group in the in the ensemble for for the show but i played drum set and uh, so that closed new year's eve of like 1990, I think, or the first day, I mean, 1989, whatever the hell it was. I remember going to a party of, 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 at, uh, at a bar and there was a percussionist named Bob Ayers, who very active, played great timpanist percussion, played, he played great. He had opened up a music rental business, you know, drums and I guess rent, you could to amps and all that stuff, but 
mostly percussion. And he had a, his shop was on 47th Street, 47th, between 9th and 10th or something like that. Like a three or four story building. They had the, old, the, old, the whole building with like just timpani, drum sets, cymbals, gongs, like everything you could imagine. And at that point, I was so fed up. I stopped playing for about a year and a half. I asked him at that at that night at that bar, do you need a truck driver or something like that? I basically worked as a truck driver for him for a year and a half. Wow. I I, I would go walk into sessions and people would, hey, Paul, how are you doing? I said, great. Where do you want this timpani? Where do you want the timpani? I'd be bringing <laughs> stuff in. That's where I want my wife, which if I was working, you know, six days a week at the weird hours that we work, you know, we would have, we would have never, you know, gotten together, you know, so she caught me, she caught me at the wrong time, but then I started working again and she really, unfortunately is like, holy shit, when are you going to be around? Where are you? What are you doing, man? Mm. No. But she's my first wife and only wife. So it's, we're still together. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. 26 year old daughter. Yeah. I have a 26 year old daughter. Wow. Your kids, Culinary Institute of America, CIA, what, what, yeah. man. She, your do- no, your daughter. I saw yes, that. I saw yes. your, your daughter starting there. Yes, How's that? Is. It's How's very that? interesting. I'm, I'm How's her at... knife skills? How's her knife skills? <laughs> <laughs> her knife skills are, are pretty, pretty, pretty impressive from what I saw and from what she's telling me from her, her instructors. And I can't wait to see what she's cooking for Thanksgiving. Great. Great. <laughs> Lovely, lovely, man. Lovely. So, yeah, it's it's interesting yeah. to be, um, yeah. you know, this part of parenthood, watching yeah. kids grow up in high school and yeah. off to college. Yeah. But anyway, that's that's, that's on my fatherhood podcast. We'll be talking about that. Beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. So I'm I'm I for a year and a half, basically, I'm not, you know, I don't know if you I picked up sticks. I was just like so fried from wow. from cats, from like my am I. Paul Pazuti, the person, and my Paul Pazuti, the drummer. How how do they overlap? It was weird. It was a weird time, but it was a good time too to get to get some space. I have a friend, Julio Fernandez, who's the guitarist in Spyrogyra. He's a local guy here. I've known him since the eight. I mean, we we played in some groups together. He said, "Hey, Paul, we're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm playing the jam." at the China Club on Wednesday nights. You want to do it. So for, I, I guess I shouldn't say I wasn't playing any drums during that year and a half. Because I, at some point, I started doing that. And that lasted a year. Wednesday night starting at midnight, going to like four o'clock. And like, you know, every fucking band in the world came to play in there or people would come and sit in at so the china you were the, club. you were the house drummer for the the, the, the china club yeah I, I, back i wonder if back I, in the early yeah i, I don't know I, bur- bur- I early 90s you. what oh no, i got here in 93 well, <laughs> yeah when, yeah i don't think it was still ha- i don't think i was doing it then okay. i don't think i was doing it in the, by 93 i just remember yeah, the china club it was a cool little spot yeah yeah up in the 70s on uh, broadway yeah 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 it was uh so some great, great drummers, so some great groups. You know, we play one set and then, you know, sometimes we play with other band, with other people, but, you know, it was often groups would come up and play, you know. Hmm. So I'm doing that. I'm also working at a, fr- a friend, one of the guys I was in a, in that group with when I was a teenager, he started a piano company, basically a piano tuning but piano, he would be two two pianos. He also refinished pianos. Did the whole piano, like you know, like a Steinway finish, a Bosendorfer finish, like just amazing stuff. And I worked with. He asked, "Oh, if you're not doing anything, I'll give you, you know, like five bucks an hour, and we'll hang out all day, you know, and you'll help me." So I did that for about a year before, you know, during the day, and then sometimes I I go to the China Club. So it was weird. I. It was with my wife or with my girlfriend at the time. Then I get a phone call from Ron Sell, who was a French horn player. He's passed away a while ago. He was, 
he worked for Gemignani as a contractor. He would contract a lot of things. Assassins had run already, however it ran in, in its first iteration. Oh, I think it was off Broadway. I'm not sure. We're doing an album. Do you want to do it? And I, so I kind of jokingly, I didn't do it to him, but like, I, I guess I had a date book. I'm looking at my date book and it's like, you know, it looks like the Great North and a whiteout, you know? So it was like, yeah, I'm free, you know? So I did the Assassin's album, which I had no idea what the music was. I, I knew anything about it other than it was about presidential assassins, you know? So I do that. So, you know, Gemignani is like, how you doing? You know, you stopped, about everything. Okay, I say, everything's fine, everything's fine. Then I get a phone call to do Crazy For You. That got me started again. A, uh, Susan Stroman was the choreographer. They pulled you back in. It's like they the pulled me did. back in. I just can't leave. <laughs> well, this was only 92, you know, so it was like, you know, we're talking 20 years or 30 years. Oh my God, it's 30 years ago. I know. It's 30 years ago, isn't it? 92? 92, yeah. <sighs> wow. Yeah, wow. I got, when I realized I'll be here in 29 <laughs> years, I'm like, wait a minute, that's more than half of my life. I gotta get out of here, dude. I gotta leave. But I'm not leaving. So yet. that's this. Yeah, you did. That's the second. You know, that's the the second comment. All position, whatever. So crazy. That started. So you did crazy for you, and uh, crazy for you. That lasted for. I think. I think I left there before it closed. It was in the middle of the second year. Uh, a Christmas Carol started at. What's whatever it is now it was the felt forum back then. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, it was one of those, it was kind of like a Radio City thing. It was like 90 shows over the course of a month or two. It was just really crazy. Now, I'm thinking, you know, big the show big was coming in supposedly in springtime. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what. Instead of, you know, going back to crazy for you for a month or so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit it and take off and just relax for a while. Hmm. So I said, you know, I thought about it. I think, I don't know if Jody and I, Jody and I had just gotten married, I think. It's like, yeah, that'd be great. I'll be fine. Got money in the bank. You know, it's fine. It's fine. I quit the show. Big gets pushed back six months. Ooh. And we're pregnant. Mm. <laughs> so I was subbing a crazy for you, which was easy. I didn't have to learn, learn it. I remember calling Ron Tierno and saying, Ron, if you know, I, I know you probably have a lot of subs, but if you need anyone, you know, I'm around. And we laughed, you know, aha, uh -huh, okay, yeah. He said, I, I got, you know, I'm covered, but, you know. He calls me up, like, I think a couple of days later and said, are you free? X he, he gives me a whole shitload of days because he, people weren't free for when he did. So I started subbing at Cats again. Ooh. I subbed, at, yeah, I was subbing back at Cats. What was that I was like? subbing. Wait, wait, go back. <laughs> what was that like going What was that like? To, yeah, you were like, oh, God, I got it. It's like going back to your ex-wife. You like, you had ex no, it wasn't quite, wasn't quite that bad. It okay. wasn't quite that bad. Right. It, it was, yeah, no, it wasn't, you know, no matter what I went through in the 80s there, it was, it was a different time period. It was fine. It was fine. And I knew the show. I didn't have to think about it. You know, I mean, I, I played it well, but I kind of played my show. You know, I mean, Ron, did the you know, I saw him play you, it. Did the conductor give you like, notes? And he like, you know, you no, know, nobody, gave, <laughs> nobody gave me any notes. Nobody gave me any notes. You know? Usually, usually I'd be fired and they'd tell me after the fact that I was called back <laughs> because they didn't want you as a sub. <laughs> That's happened a couple of times. And I and they said, Well, you know, we didn't I said, I knew I was I knew I was fired. You didn't have to tell me, you know. Mm. So th that's a that's a funny thing too. So I'm subbing there and I subbed a, a, a Ray Marchico was doing how to succeed with with Matthew Broderick. 
I sub, he got me to sub for him. Oh, what else? I, I was subbing about five or six shows. I know that. Um, uh, four more shows other than I, I don't crazy for you and cats don't count really because I knew them, you know. But there was a bunch of other shows that I subbed at. Then big opened and closed in six months. It didn't do well, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. Yikes. It was, uh, it was, but so I don't know. Where are we? Like 96? 96, yes. Yeah. So I don't remember. I mean, I remember doing more subbing. I remember subbing at, at Jekyll and Hyde, which was kind of wild, a wild show. Jim Saparito had the drum chair and Randy Max, who was, uh, who has since passed away, was the timpanist. Randy Max was the was the timpanist in the New Jersey Symphony. He was great, great guy, great guy. And J- Jim is a great drummer and a great percussionist. And he had to set up. There was uh, a taiko drum, you know, the big ass Japanese over his head. Wow. That's the only place they could put it. There was one tune where he just played, and he like wailed on the thing. It was like, oh, this is fucking great, man. You know. <laughs> But you had to play orchestra bells, you know, there was, like, you know, Hyde with like, you know, or, or Jekyll, whatever that, you know, you hear, you know, like a, like a bell tone. And I remember one time, my back is turned, you kind of seeing the conductor in a mirror and I fucked it up completely. And I was like, oh, this is great, man. This is, this is great. But, and you had to. Run, there were three or four steps where Randy was behind you. And you had to go up there and play concert bass drum, some piatti, and, and other stuff up there. So it was back and forth and playing. And I played that for a while. I took over for Jim. He left to do a, a Fosse, I think, a, a musical called Fosse. Mm. And Jim's great. Jim is great musician i learned a lot from i learned a lot from ray watching ray play watching jim play you know then jim and yanni's doing the the uh uh, 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 paul calls me up for uh kiss me kate i guess it's in 98 or 99 something like that 2000 yeah 99 yeah Yeah. it it definitely went through 9 11 was we we stayed open a bit uh, another couple of months after that you know, but that was fun. That was that was a lot of fun. And you know, I mean, Je- Je- Paul Gemignani, you know, basically gave me most of my work. I mean, I've worked for other conductors, you know, but uh, he he's the one who most often would would call me for things. And uh, over the past 10, 15 years, you know, everything he did at the roundabout, he did a lot of roundabout productions that. I always did. If not me, Larry Lelly. Now, Larry's somebody you should talk to. Oh, so yeah. Larry's yeah. been around for a while. He's a great musician, conductor, conducts great, plays drums, plays percussion. Really good. Really good. I remember meeting Larry vaguely. I remember well, he remembers meeting me more than I remember meeting him. I think it was at Kiss Me Kate. But, uh, he could tell you about that. I don't, I don't remember. It was it was good. It was good. It wasn't anything negative, but uh, it's it. Well, I mean, look, looking back, look at Evita. Here's this multi million dollar production about to open, and they get a new drummer in two days before it opens. You know, I mean, it's like things don't always go as planned. I think they thought, well, you know, this other young guy we got. Well, he can play the rock stuff. Yeah, it might, he might have been able to, but he couldn't read very well. And then it's like, well, I'm just talking to the conductor and he believes everything I'm saying. I could have been a psychotic. Who knows who I was? You know? <laughs> and I go in and, you know, I, I, I did it. I did it. I guess I did what I was supposed to do, you know. So it, 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 it can be, I mean, I think it's a lot less iffy these days. People, people either know each other more or there's more of a, an online presence that where you can see about someone's past, you know, whereas, you know, if you can find anything from me, I'd be amazed. Yeah, it's but, not, uh, easy. not easy. No, it's not <laughs> easy. Not easy. But I mean, two, so I, there was one other time I wanted to, 
to, to just to talk about that. I'm if if I got any uh, uh, pr pride at all, it was at least doing that Evita thing and and keeping the gig and not fucking up and like actually I guess I did sight read the show. Not not at the show, but I did sight read it with the piano player. And then, you know, next thing I know, I'm with the orchestra. I'm doing Patty Le I'm doing Gypsy with Patty Lapone. I guess 2010, 2012. I don't know. You probably have have it down somewhere. Right? You got it somewhere, right? <laughs> Patty you know. Lepone, uh... <laughs> oh, I, I, it... oh, oh no, I don't have it down here. Because it's so hard to find information from you, which is the reason. Why oh, I'm it's around. It's around. It's around. It's. I, I don't remember when it was exactly, but um, uh, probably 2010 or probably somewhere around there. Okay. So she's doing the show on Broadway. We do. It's the Tonys, and you know the orchestra is up in a separate room, and you know it's like. So I think we went in to do a rehearsal during the day. You know, everything's coming up roses, the big, you know, ball buster to the crazy, crazy tune, you know. Go back home. Come back in to uh, to New York. And it's it's at Radio City and the orchestra's upstairs. So we play the tune. You know, everybody's happy, screaming, you know, she's, you know, the belter. She's a... I'm at Port Authority getting on the bus back to Hoboken. And I see um, my phone, right? And it's John Beal, who, John Beal is a legendary bass player. John, John has done everything. He's, if you ever do a bass player podcast, or you could check, you know Richie Rosenzweig? You know Richie? I don't think I know him. I, I know who he is. Richie's though. doing the new, co the new uh, company. Okay. He's doing okay. a new company. And he's got a, a podcast called Big Noise from Planet Earth, where mm. it's him talking to bass players. And John is the last bass player of this season that he talks to. John has a, an amazingly varied career, but he did the Tonys for like 30 plus years, you know, in the orchestra. So I'm seeing it, it's John Beale. Oh, yeah. Hey, John, how, yeah. how, how you doing? And John says, hey, Paul, you still in New York? Eh. I mean, and he's like, he, he I, 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 I love John. You know, it's like, he's very like, you know, calm. I said, yeah, I'm just getting on the bus. He said, oh, Ronnie, Ronnie's not feeling real well at the moment. So something he ate, I think. Can you come back and, and play the rest of the broadcast? And I said, oh, yeah, sure. So I get off the bus. I'm at 42nd and 8th. And I take a cab up there to 50th street, you know, the back of radio city. And I'm going upstairs and I'm saying, what did I just say I'm going to do? <laughs> so I get off at the seventh floor and Ronnie, Ronnie Zito is outside. And I said, oh, great. He's okay. He doesn't need me. He's like, Hey Paul, man, I'm glad you're here. I'm really, and it's like, okay. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so I go in. And it's the whole fucking Tony orchestra. You know, it's the whole big, you know, Jim Pugh, Bob Milliken, Tony Catholic. I mean, great. Lawrence Feldman. I mean, it's just like, you know, the creme de la creme mm. of New York recording, of world recording. And so I get behind the drums and it's like, yeah, and Elliot Lawrence, it, this was an Elliot Lawrence was still alive. It was his orchestra. And you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you uh, I'd never worked with Elliot before. He was just happy that someone was there, you know, that I guess wasn't going to get sick and fall over. And it's like, well, when the winners come up, here's the five tunes and you got to pick, you know, he'll start conducting and then you get, and it's like, okay. And these are the tunes we're going to do between, you know, for the playoffs and play ons. It's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And then it's like, you know, okay, 10, 9. Eight. Oh, my God. Okay. 
And John said, oh, I'll help you through it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> and so half an hour goes by and I played the Tony broadcast live. Wow. And the only thing I fucked up was Gypsy. That's because funny. it was like not an arrangement that, you know, I was like reading it, but it was like slightly, I didn't fuck it up, fuck it up. But I was just like, oh, that's what I was supposed to play. <laughs> you know, cool. it's like, Wow. So I, I, you know, I, I, I thought that was like, well, okay, there'd be something, you know, that I could put on my gravestone, you know, what sight year? read. <laughs> what year was this again? I don't know. <laughs> it was look, look at Patty Lapone, Jip when she did Gypsy on Broadway. Come okay. on, you, you've got monitors, you got the DARPA <laughs> connection there. You can find it quicker than I can. I don't know where it is. I mean, let me call Alex where... Jones and maybe he'll. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! But but that was that was like I felt and went back to the show the next day, and uh, the sax player or the next day or two days whatever. And Adam Kolker was one of the reed players. Now, Adam's, you know, plays, I, I saw him play a lot of jazz. I think I got his, one of his first CDs, where it was John Ab Abercrombie and John E. Bear playing bass and Paul Motion playing drums. And I, th I think he said, he told Motion, yeah, the drummer, like he just, you know, went in and played the last half hour of sight read. And like motions, oh, I can't do that, man. <laughs> I couldn't do that. It's like, well, Paul, neither could this Paul. He just faked <laughs> his way through it. But I, it was just, it was like playing to a track, play, to be perfectly honest. It was like, I was like playing to somebody's recording. The, the band sound, it was so easy. It was, it was not terrifying because it was so easy to do. It just sounded so perfect that, you know, oh, I'm just playing along with a record here. Mm. That's what it sounded like. That's what playing at, the same, at, at, at Hello Dolly sounded like, playing for Buddy. The band was so tight and sounded so good that oh, – it wasn't like all I did was go for long for the ride, but it was like playing to this perfect track. It was like, sometimes it's like, sometimes it's just great. Sometimes it, it, it I remember looking after I went in to see the show finally, you know, to, to sub for him. Mm -hmm. I remember listening, you know, practicing it and it wasn't that hard. It was like an old classic Broadway show. And it's just like, this is, this is not, you know, I didn't feel like any tumbling on my stomach or anything weird. It was like, this is, you know, this is fine. As long as I play with the bass player, the trumpets and the brass and the horn, the, all, they were just perfect, you know. 2008. Yeah. Gypsy, Pat Lepone. Okay, that's fine. I yeah. believe you. I believe yeah. you. I worked with her a lot. I worked with, with Patty a lot doing a whole bunch of her acts and concerts mm -hmm. and various things, you know, okay. over the years. That was, uh, you know, we, 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 we reconnected. You know, I didn't know her at Evita. You know, that was, I think, her first big show, show but I could be wrong about that. But she did a show call, at, at Carnegie Hall called... Uh, I don't know if it was Lady Sings the Blues or something. I don't know what it was. It was like a nine piece band. And we met at the rehearsal studio. And I said, Patty, I, I did, I did a Vita. Oh, and it, you know, we just hug and, you know, and that went well. And then I started working with her, you know, a lot from then on, you know, when, whenever she was doing concerts and stuff like that, you know, with that group or with smaller groups. And so, so that was, uh, that was, that was, that was funny. That was very, very, very funny. Elaine Stritch was another one. I don't know if you know the name. <laughs> My girlfriend told me about her, and there was a documentary on her. Right. Yeah, okay. it was very, very I, interesting. I didn't know anything about yes. her. I, I get a call from Red Press. I guess this is early 2000s. 
saying, Paul, uh, Elaine Stritch is doing an act at the Carlisle, and I'd like you to do it. It was going to be with a sextet, three horns, piano, bass, and drums. And I said, fine. He said, have you ever worked with Elaine before? And I said, no, you're in for a ride. And I said, okay. So I go to the Carlisle. I've never been in the, the room, you know, where the, all the, you know, Woody Allen and all the people play, whatever. And it's like the worst setup you can think of. It's basically the piano's dead center. The small stage is in front of the piano. The bass and the three horns were on the other side of the piano. And I was on the other side of the piano. So I couldn't hear the band and like they couldn't change the setup. And so she comes in and, ah, da, 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 da. you know, she's, she's like a real, she basically she's not saying it. Anymore. And I'm realizing like, this is like playing for my mother. <laughs> this reminds me of my mother. She reminds me of my mother. And it was fine from then on. It was, you know, or I didn't have any fear necessarily doing it but it was like oh you know and i think red says on this she reminds me of my mother <laughs> it's like it's fine and he was i think he laughed i don't remember exactly but worked with her for quite a while you know on and off doing concerts at the at mostly at the carlisle i guess it was there so it was it, it was just fun you know it was just fun tell me about the transition from <laughs> the 70s to 80s to 90s how did you know I was transitioning? Oh, transition on Broadway. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. Hey, so, hey yeah. you know, so you can you can keep that in or take it out. Yeah, exactly. You want to do. <laughs> Let me edit that one out. Uh, <laughs> transforming it from <laughs> go on from, from the I guess not having monitors to having this the hotspots oh. to having mm -hmm. headphones to not having a click. To show always having a click most mostly. Uh was that something that you came to I guess uh I'm trying to think of the right word. Was it something that you just gravitated towards and just figured out saying, like, okay, I gotta take this on, you gotta do this next like when I talked to some drummers that were doing a lot of studio work in the seventies and the drum machine came out, they're like, Oh man, either you adapt to it or you find a way around it. Right. Or you do both. Uh, right. What was your experience okay. like with with the the monitoring system and, and how you adjusted to that? And also with shows doing mostly click tracks now? Well, I I would say the vast majority of the work I've done is without a click track on Broadway. Uh, maybe that's because of the conductor I work with most, mostly Paul Gemini does not like the click track unless you have to absolutely have it in the show. If they need to double track some vocals while the dancers are singing and they can't sing full out. So likewise, you know, if I had, well, for example, at, 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 uh, I've subbed at Aladdin. There's no click, but I have the the, the headset on a, as loud as my ears can take it. You know, which I'm going to be going to Costco soon to get my uh, my uh, hearing aids. <laughs> but it, it's is is there a click on Aladdin? I don't think so. Um, Dolly, I had the headset on. And, you know, I probably, I think I had like my, my union ear, earbuds in, you know, to, and then the headset over that and just cranked it up loud was that I could hear everything clearly, you know? Yeah. I, I, I just haven't done, a, I mean, I'm being honest. I haven't done a lot of shows with click tracks, you know, and that's, th th that's been the way my career has gone, you know, and. So I, 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 I do know I, I mean, one example, what, 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 when I did the show called The Frogs at, at uh, Lincoln Center and it's in the, the, the stage is the, the orchestra is kind of like in a horseshoe around the stage. And 
once again, it's, you know, Paul Gemignani. And the sound was putting in these monitors, you know, around the horseshoe. And he's like, well, what are you putting them in for? Well, that way, the other side of the orchestra could hear, hear, and it's like, there's no delay. And he said, no, it's an orchestra. They know how to play together. Mm. Very old school. I wouldn't say, I don't even put it old school. Very acoustic, very, you know. So, I mean, the contemporary shows like, you know, like Kinky Boots, Moulin Rouge, all this, I mean, it's a lot more pop oriented. You know, you mm -hmm. have to hear what's going on. I think you have to hear what's going on exactly to be able to play with everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, oh my God, I just remembered, uh, uh, I subbed that uh, Larry, Larry Lelly was doing Million Dollar Quartet. I don't know if you've ever seen it or know about the show. Yeah. I had to memorize, I had a couple of lines <laughs> and you had to memorize all the music. And it was loud on stage. The band when when the band when when Carl Perkins would kick into it, it was great. But you know, I've just played in so many odd situations, Clayton. I wouldn't say odd. It's just that this is this is uh, not what I have had to deal with. Not what I had to deal with. You know, headphones. You know few times but click tracks no i remember just going to see ray play mama mia once and he was nice enough to like he said well i got subs but if you want to come down and check it out and ray's a great player ray a, a, super consistent plays great and i'm looking i'm saying he's got to control the click for the band He's got to, you know, at times you don't play. See, if I'm going to, I feel sometimes like if I have a click, it's, oh, I did a weird show. Okay. Remind me, come fly away after this. It's a story, you know, the Sinatra thing. I just saw what Ray was doing. And also he's got the most, cons not, not to put him above anybody else, but he's got a really consistent rim shot backbeat. You know, not that any of the other drummers you talk to don't, except me. I'm looking <laughs> and I'm saying, he's got to, he's turning on and off the click track. Every every backbeat's got to be a rim shot, you know, a nice oh, solid. Really? Thing. And, and yeah, I mean, but, but Ray's got the, the technique. I mean, th that's what I remember. I just remember there's too many variables here for me to learn it. I think I had the music and I was like, I know the tunes. It's not like that, but it's. You know, you know, luckily something else probably came up at that point. I don't even remember when I looked at him, saw him play, but, but it's been years, you know. Anyway, you know, he had me sub at the new uh, uh, Miss Saigon, which was, that was fun and wacky at the same time. That was like wild. Because, I mean, I took a picture of the drum set, the setup, and it was like, people are looking at it, it was like, what the fuck is that? I mean, it's just like drums, taiko, extra set of hi hats with Chinese symbols on them, so you're getting that clang. Orchestra bells, temple blocks. Uh, uh, let's see, that was on one side. Behind you, it was a full set of crotales, a xylophone, some. Uh, cro uh, uh, then you had to move to the percussion chair to play some walk down and play some uh, chimes and marimba, you know, very simple marimba. You know, don't, I mean, don't get me wrong, but you still had to play, <laughs> had to play it right. You know, that was, that was a lot of fun. Ray, Ray has always been a sweetheart to me and very, you know, that's great that he just like, you know, and the drums were like, you know, like he, 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 he got, his pearl set or the pearl set there it's just like <sighs> you know it's like you didn't have to exactly play what he played for fills and stuff although i try to but like i i can't get out of my own ego sometimes it's hard <laughs> but it was it it was great it was great what was come the fly, other one come fly away come fly away 
Sinatra. The band is all these Sinatra veterans or bassy people. Wow. Jay Anderson was playing bass, who is great. Russ Kassoff was the, the leader. Jim Titterillo, I think, playing guitar. All great, 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 great players with long histories of this music. There's a click in this show. There was a click that I think Ross did, Russ Kassoff did to Sinatra's vocals. So it's a very, that only the rhythm section is hearing. The horns don't have that. They're not listening to me playing to a click. I'm playing, I had to sort of figure out, well, what's happening right in this section where the click gets a little, is it is it moving around a little bit? It's going with the vocals, but am I just going to play? It was very, it was a great experience. It was a lot of fun just playing with these people. But it was that that was strange there that, that's that there's a click experience that i had that was not quite like your regular click a normal the click. click moved in tempo yeah yeah really wow yeah well i mean you know i'm sure if you put a click to the sinatra tunes it was as near as perfect as it probably could get but for whatever reason they put a click one tune they did a version of take five don't ask me why Take Five was in the show, but they did Take Five. And that was without a click. And that was the hardest tune for me to play. Because I was so used to playing with the click that it, it, was, it was weird for me. It was weird. It was, it was great. The band sounded great. I mean, it was a small group. But so it was like maybe more exposed. And you got a drum solo. And plus, Ooh. I'm playing a drum solo. Wow. Yeah, like take five. I mean, not exactly the, I don't think you're playing the Morello solo, right. you know, or anything like that. But so that was, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a click person. I'm not, I'm not, you know, the, the, the avionics and clicks and, and quantum, quantum mechanics and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm not, you know. <laughs> I hear you. I, I'm not the biggest fan of the click either. And well, I realized that. In my show, it's all click, and you just have to play with it. Understandably, yeah. it's just the way, you know, with all this dancing and stuff, they want everything to be consistent. One thing, Clayton, may I interrupt you? Although, you, you know, at this point, you must realize, man, this motherfucker loves to interrupt people. <laughs> when people started, when I first started hearing clicks on Broadway, or of clicks, um, I mean, you have to take it with a grain of salt. You know, my 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 comment, my comment about myself always, but who am I? I heard someone say, then there's no argument with the choreographer or something slower or faster. You know, it's it's always this. I remember doing a summer stock tour when I was 19 of No No Nanette, an old old musical, old Broadway musical. It was one of the new revivals in the 70s that all of a sudden was a big hit because it was, you know, from the 1920s. I don't know. The lead comes over to the one of the pianos. It was two pianos and percussion. That was the tour that we did. She comes over to the leader and says, oh, that tempo was too fast. You know, you have to slow it down a little bit. And he's like, uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. She walks away and he says, turns to me and says, don't do anything differently. I said, okay. We play the tune again. She comes over and says, oh, that was great. And he smiles at her and he turns to me and says, you see? <laughs> so, okay. Jumping in time, 40 years, 30 years, whatever. Clicks start happening. And it's like, yes, it makes it more right and more dependable time-wise but to me and who am i that's what broadway is it's the conductor interacting with the orchestra interacting with the stage so is it broadway yeah it's broadway but it's not 
the classic Broadway. And things change. Things change. On pop shows, yes, it, it makes sense for there to be that locket. You know, I never heard, for example, speaking of, of, of uh, the, the, the grand rabbi, Warren Oates, I never heard the life, the show we did. But the band, they must have been grooving. And I don't think they had a click back in the early 80s. You know, they could have. I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, I imagine, you know, bands, you just said the, the drummer and the rhythm section were trusted and played. You know, not that you're not trusted now, but clicks have become so ubiquitous, you know, rather than this is what it feels like. This is what it's supposed to feel like. You know? I'm going to say something that's blasphemous. I may be the only one that thinks this way, but I think click tracks suck. I think they wow. suck on records wow. because uh, I say on records. I think they suck on records because it takes away from that feel that you're talking about. When you listen to, I, I, you know, I loved uh, Chameleon by Herbie Hancock from the first mm -hmm. Headhunters record. Oh God, that's all over the place. <laughs> it starts out, doom, got it, doom, doom. by the end, doom, got it, doom. I mean, it's fast, It's but it, it you don't really notice it. And he speeds up like about a minute in. It's Harvey Mason. It's Harvey goddamn yeah. Mason. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you listen to yeah. any any rec any recording from the first days of the recording industry up until the eighties, they didn't have a click track. So why do you need it? Now the best music was made, in my opinion, before the click track was invented. So why do you need it now? Oh, you need to sync it to uh to movies and no, you don't. Because they using arrow. You didn't need it back then. You didn't yeah, need did. it back then. <laughs> exactly. You didn't need it back then. And they sync like Guardians of the Galaxy. They're using music from the seventies, which is not on click track. You just put it in there. So anyway, I have a big thing against them because I don't. I think music sounds better and you play differently and you're playing with the group. Now I understand with Broadway. I get it because uh, are you playing with the click over there? Are you playing with the click? Yes, we're playing with the click. Sometimes I don't have to click on and <laughs> they don't even notice, just like in that example. But, uh, you yeah, know, then we turn it on and it's fine. I get it and I can play with the click. I can nail the click. I've been doing it for 20 years because that's all I've been doing, except for right. like the first couple of shows. Right. Uh, but I just think it's to rely on it so much. I just, I don't know. It's become ubiquitous. It's become a quotidian. I love the word. It, it's <laughs> like, you know, to think that it's not going to be there is like, what? Yeah. There's no click? Yeah. How is that possible? You know, some of you the know, things. How that, can you do it without a click? Right. Some of the things that a lot of drummers have been saying on this podcast, which it changed my perspective of Broadway. We mm. play, you know, we play music. And even what Brian Brake was saying. You know, I spoke to Brian. I wish he'd be on the podcast. But, you know, it's it's not about the music per se. We we're we're part of the the entire uh process. You know, there's the music, right. then there's dancing, there's singing, and there's the lights. Yeah. And the conductor, like you said, is is the liaison between the music and what's on stage and we're painting a, a picture. Right. And we're not I'm not playing just temptation song back back to back. You know, mm -hmm. I'm playing, you know, uh can't get next to you, but we, I gotta stop. And play this beat because they're dancing mm -hmm. and then they got to tell the story we're supporting that so when you're talking about having a conductor looking at the orchestra and also looking at the uh this the actors on stage they have to they're the ones that are conducting the show that's why they're dead center and that's why the light is on them and they're the biggest part of the show and keeping everything together according of course with the the lights and this the stage manager right. but right i think you know when you have that that flexibility it's different each night instead of being the same exact thing each night. But, it, but then again, going back to the modern drummer article <laughs> where people are paying $30 for top price right. tickets, right? they want the right. same, they want consistency. Well, right. but, that's the, but, but that's a job. That's what they wanted that. And they were getting that and they do get that. It's there, there's in the, the pop 
I think just popular, popular. I mean, even saying that I sound like a dinosaur. I mean, it's like it's more things are on the click or quantized or whatever. And it's like people are used to that. It's not the and, and conductors are used to that. And the feeling is that, you know, if A, B, C, you know, A through Z has done this. A through W, then if we're X, we have to do that because that's what everyone's used to. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, unless you go into a, a, a really, you know, I mean, I was a little surprised at Come From Away that there was a click track, but it's, it's, you kind of play with the click. It's kind of interesting that it was um, movable. And I'll, I'll use that lightly in the sense that, mm. you know, at times it was like, you know, I mean, there's certain Sinatra tunes where all of a sudden, you know, like he might slow down. It, it, mm-hmm. yeah, and it yeah. just, you know, it was swinging, Clayton. Believe me, I, I had a ball playing it. But mm. it was, <laughs> it was, once I realized I could ignore it and just use it as a kind of like a signpost. Yes. You know, I mean, I'm no Vinny Kalayuda or anybody else like that who, who's, you know, Weckle or, the, you know, I mean, they, have innate time, but they also they can you know make a make a click track sound invisible, like it's not really there. Was they're playing the time so well? It's just a different thing. Old Broadway was more that you know that liaison period or the period between opera. You know, I mean, it, it was like the people's opera, the, the stage productions. You know, interesting. And and you know, with, with contemporary contemporary music was still jazz. You know, or big band or swing. Yeah, that's you know, true. up to when rock came, when 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 uh, well, uh, uh, you know, hair and all that kind. Of, it's a completely different animal. You know, yeah. So Godspell, all those things. Are, you know, there wasn't any click track back in Godspell and all that stuff, no, right? No, no. But there could have been. I don't know if there wasn't a new one that Shannon played. Who I don't really know, and I shouldn't. Say, I'm not saying it in the disparaging way. Right. I'm just saying I would be surprised. If the new Evita, or I don't know, did Evita have click? No, it didn't. Okay, that's great. That's that's interesting. I should yeah. say, that's interesting. I, I, I did I Hello say... Dolly? Did a Hello Dolly have a click? No, no. See, yeah, no. They, you know, things can. But that's an old school show. Yeah, so... the conductor was wait was expecting the band to play, and it was like you know, I mean, just what Buddy played was time so simple. But so perfect, mm. just to, to as a back as a backdrop to what was going on, you know. And but some things were like I had to like what, really? That's great. But I would never think of doing a Purdy shuffle in this tune. <laughs> <laughs> but it was subtle. It was subtle. And I'm listening. I'm saying, is that what he think he's doing, man? Is that something? Yeah, I got to tell you, when I was subbing for him at uh, Motown. And yeah. I kind of copped some of his feels uh-huh. when I shouldn't say that. Is that sexist? I was copying some of his feel <laughs> to play. I understand to uh, play uh, "Ain't Too Proud" and right. we do "Baby Love." And he does this little shuffle there. I was like, I was mm-hmm. listening to what he was doing. It's just subtle. I was like, man, I gotta play it like that for my show. And he just does these little things that that add so much yeah. to, to the the point. Yeah. But yeah. Well, I mean, you know, to, to not to not stick with click tracks, they're 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 there, they're there. You just got to play with them, you know. I mean, that's what they that's All what right, they so, do. Well, let me uh, fast forward to 2019. You did "Kiss Me, Kate." Yes, again, a revival of it. Yeah, that was, was there uh, a click track on that. No, 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 so, no. They. You know, I mean, and also at Roundabout at the, at Studio Fifty Four, the orchestra is on set up on two different sides of the theater in the boxes. Hmm. Yeah. So I had, I mean, I think I had the Evian. Believe it or not, just a speaker. I don't even think I had. I don't remember if I had a an earbud or not. And I just I played along with John was playing bass and Joe, uh, 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 Jason. Rothberg was playing guitar. Jason? Shit. 
he's going to help if he hears this. He's gonna hate I'll, edit, I'll edit name. that out. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and you know, I could hear the the horns from the other side, and I just played with them that way. The original Kiss Me Kate was done in the theater with Moulin Rouge's, and the band was set up like a regular, you know, pit, and that was you could hear everything. There was no, there was definitely no uh, speakers in that. There was definitely other, no speakers. One other thing I'd like to ask you. Yes. Go, going from, only one. <laughs> <laughs> going from the the seventies till today, seeing how the pits were actually Broadway pits, and the sound would go out. Yeah. With everything yeah. being mic'd. Yeah. Uh, to then going into drum booths and having yeah. a, everyone being separate. You saw the evolution of all that. Must have been interesting <laughs> to say, "All right, your show now. You're going to be in a drum booth." Were, were you like, "What? What do you mean? I'm going to be in dr the drum booth? Why can't I be with the rest of the orchestra?" Did you see that, you know, coming, or were you just well with with me? It was more, you know, putting uh, you know panels around me. I wasn't necessarily in a dedicated booth in the shows that I've done. You know, not like. A, you know, once again, I'll just go back to Ray doing Mamma Mia. That was like the first time I saw a booth. You know, he was in a booth, you know, doors and, you know, the whole thing. I, I wasn't hired for those shows. You know, I, I through, through the grace of the powers that be, and I mean, mostly contractors, I'm not talking about a higher power. <laughs> uh, I, I just, you know, whatever I've done was like, you know, not that was not the genre, you know, like I'm, I'm not the person to. To talk about in any intelligent sort of way about drum booths or, or, or the separation that much. I, I don't mean that. I mean, the, the question is intelligent. What I'm saying is my experience. Right, right was never like that. I mean, at Cats, I remember, was the first time I was in a show where the orchestra was on stage behind, but behind the scenery. But we were in an open, an open, you know, floor and the trumpet, you know, the, the most of the band was on the floor. Uh, it was stage, whatever that part of stage is, stage left, stage right, the right side of the stage. I've only been doing Broadway for 40, for 50 years, I still don't know what stage left and stage right is. So <laughs> there and up top were three trumpets and two trombones and a vocal booth, you know, for backup singers up top. So but nothing was enclosed. Nothing was enclosed. It was live sound. You know, I must admit when I saw the show once because I was interested in seeing what it was like the first year that it was done. And I was it then or I might have heard it. The first time I heard it, the sound was pretty good. You could hear everything. The second time, it sounded like synthesizers and drums and the occasional solo instrument. You know, oh, there's the oboe. Oh, there's the trumpet. Da, 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 you know, the, the heavy side layer thing or whatever. So the sound people, the producers, the director decide what they want you to hear, what they want you to hear. I was used to sub it. The producers is an interesting thing. I, I subbed there for Larry, Lelly. Larry was doing it when I was there, when I, uh, I was doing it when he was there. Uh, went to see the show. You know, my, my wife got tickets for Father's Day. I went with my mother-in-law and her. I went down to the pit, said, you know, hi to, you know, whoever was talking to me. You know, not everyone's talking to me. And then I went back to the, the seat. We're like six, seven rows back. The over starts, it sounded like someone was punching you in the face with the music. It was like a, a, a technicolor musical on steroids. The choreographer, who shall remain nameless, Susan Stroman, loves everything to be as loud as possible. And then the dance accents will be louder even. So I remember the show starts with like a, you know, like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but it was some subtle choke symbol stuff and it's like can't even hear it can't even hear it it's just a blah, it's blast you know and it didn't sound no no acoustic sound at all i heard no acoustic sound at all with everything coming from the speakers and that's the way it is that's that's the way it is it's like movies albums it's not like a, a, it 
it's live in that the band is live, but it's not like what what I think of as live sound. I don't know. I mean, I, I last thing I once saw after 9-11, when the Winter Garden was finally opened again, I remember going there with my wife and daughter, and they're actually having they're going to be doing a concert, uh, the Concert Cabal wind ensemble or European orchestra or something, but it was the wind, oboes and bassoons and stuff. And I could hear them on stage, you know, just they were playing through something. And it's like, oh, this is nice. The acoustic sound, you really have to listen. You know, then the sound man turned the sound, the microphones on. And it was like, I don't want to listen to an oboe or a bassoon through a speaker because it sounds like an oboe or bassoon through a speaker. You know, I like I like a smaller, more intimate thing, but that's that's just me, you know. So I, I I've always with sound people, I've always like, you know, um, God bless them, they have to work, but it's like I've done things with cinders where it's like, could you turn the monitor down and it was still loud? Could you just turn this monitor off? I can I can hear the singer perfectly well from where I'm sitting mm. or through other monitors. I do not need this monitor at nine, you know, and you won't put it down. Look, so just turn it off. I, I, I can get curmudgeonly, you know, sometimes. <laughs> but then again, mind. I'm not working a lot these days, so <laughs> it's great. It's working out all the way around. <laughs> <laughs> Well, after 50 years of working many, many shows, it's pretty impressive, yeah. man. You've done so much. Yeah. Over the past, over those decades, did you ever get uh, endorsements from drum companies? <laughs> this is going to be short. No. Really? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I never things. pursued. I never pursued any. Okay. I like, I like Pearl. I like GMS when I played them. I like DW, except for their hardware. I think their oh hardware God, is heavy. an worst. abomination. <laughs> it's just like, it, it's like I hurt myself trying to untighten and move things, you know? You know? I don't know who thought of that, man. I was, the drums I, are great. The drums yeah, are, are great. I don't have nothing. Of, I have no problem with most drums, except maybe Kent or Zimgar, you know? Man. I mean, the, my first set of drums was Zimgar. Set. Wow. Orange Sparkle. Orange Sparkle. <laughs> but um yeah no so i i never pursued any i never i, I clayton i'm like this is going to be a short section just like walking talking about the history of uh click tracks on broadway <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry you know what make up something <laughs> <laughs> he was the North endorser. Remember North? Yeah, North big... drums. Yes, yes. <laughs> he used North exclusively until they went out of business, <laughs> and then it devastated him, and he could not find another company with that's that North he, sound. That's why he cut hats. <laughs> yeah, I look. Because they couldn't me. fit the drums. They couldn't <laughs> fit the drums in the pit. <laughs> I do remember looking at Modern Drummer and seeing those drums. It was like, what? Oh, yeah, man. Those are wild. Those are wild. Oh, I knew some people who had them. And really? it's like, yeah, I guess the sound goes out, but doesn't the sound go out normally anyway? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a great gimmick. It looks great. I you know. Did Cobham have them? Did Cobham ever have them? I don't no, know. I know we use the the octaton, the tom, you know, the yeah. the camera stuff and all that shit. I but... wonder how how you pack up those North drums. I mean, did they have like cases that were like? Yeah, I uh, mean, they look like giant mushrooms. I mean, like you know, it's like the cornucopias. You know, like you know, and you can put your <laughs> holiday turkey in it too while you're waiting with freezer packs. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Don't forget to check out dreams. So yeah, the Billy Cobham. Do that. I mean, really, seriously, you'll be like, what? Whoa, uh, man, this is like, you know, funkier than the first album of, of Mahavishnu, which is a great album. That's another album that I listened to and I got scared of and I didn't listen to for another 40 years. Mm. You know, then I actually kind of transcribed a couple of tunes and it made sense. Wow. You know, some great stuff, man, on that first album. 
That's not Burns one. of Fire, is it? It's just a black one. No, though. this is Inner Mountain Flame. Yes. Oh, oh. Those, those titles back then were just <laughs> yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was, you know, Sri Chimnoy. He's still into, I guess, the uh, the whole the whole meditation thing. What is that first the tune? Visions of the Emerald Beyond. Yeah, I, I, you know, after the first two albums, I really didn't listen to him much after that. Any, any of the other drummers that played with him. Inner Mountain you know. Flame was first, and then Birds of Fire, which I love that album, man. I'm trying to think of the first album. There's that tune in nine mm-hmm. eight that starts with the drums. Meeting of the Spirits. Oh yeah, Vital that, Transformation. That. Oh yeah, man, that shit is no joke. Man. I love that beat. I love that beat. Oh, and then he comes in with a tambourine after yeah. like the first couple of buttons. It's Somebody's like, how like... oh, he's playing. It's like, whoa. <laughs> but it took me 40 years to listen to it again and realize, oh, I'm slowing it down. And now I can just in my head, I could. I'm just doing yeah. oompa, 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 oompa. If I play that underneath it, <laughs> it's, oh, it's like really? three, four, and a, th- and a, a, a three, eight, or a six, and a two, and three, and one, two, three. It's nine, eight. I mean, they do a lot of things in nine, weird things in nine, subdivisions. Okay, enough about me. Enough about Billy. <laughs> so I have no endorsements. I have no life. What else? <laughs> what else should we go? <laughs> And you are retired now. I, I am. I am retired. I've. I've. Uh, as I started collecting my pension about a, a, a year ago, 2019, late late 2019, and then the uh, the, the proverbial shit hit the fan in March 2020. Mm. I've been playing. I was playing a bit in the beginning of 2020, and you know the the end of 2019. I was sort of. I won't get into it. It was yeah. not important, <laughs> but I was doing some stuff and then the thing happened, you know, the thing happened and, uh, yes. you know, I, I'm playing occasionally now here and there. I just played Friday night with, you know, v- very occasional, just like either sitting in or doing a, an odd job here or there. All right, I, I just did a very strange gig this week that it was all James Bond music, really, which was kind of interesting, but I'd have to talk to you about that. Off <laughs> recording in North Camera. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, if there was a third revival of Cats and they're like, Paul, I want you to play it, would you do it? Well, first of all, Paul wouldn't do it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he wouldn't do it. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I think my, my, my days of watching someone wave their hands in front of me are are over you know maybe i don't know i I would never say never but it's it can it'll run for another 13 years but i want you to play all 13 (laughs) well if the pension stays okay then i really don't have to worry about it Mm. i really shouldn't worry about it no i i was fortunate the time when i was i don't want to get into the pension discussion because that could be open up a can of worms but i'm i'm fortunate i've got what i've got very, very fortunate, very grateful for it. I want to be like you because I'm ready to retire. Actually, I'm not really ready, but I, I'm ready to move to another level, just like you. I will get there. All right, I know. You've got, you've got, I mean, I you've got, got a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, Clayton, that all seem very intelligent and very, very good to do. And I, you know, other than playing, I'd just say you, you, you know, it, it's playing has been great in some ways. Playing has been, you know, a mixed blessing in other ways for me. When I stop and look back and I think, wow, I mean, I've been doing this since I was like 18, you know, doing shows. And before that, I was playing and I was having, I think I was having fun. Then school, was I having fun at school? I don't remember. I just kind of let all of a sudden it's like I'm 67. I mean, it's like, wow. You know, hey man, you've done, you know, I got, I've only I, been doing this 21 years. You've been doing it 50. I got 30 more years to, to, yeah, yeah. I don't have 30 more years, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I'd be well, 80, 85. I, I, 
I know. Well, look at Roy. Look at Roy Haynes, man. He's 94. He's still playing, but he's Roy Haynes too, man. Exactly. I'm just Clayton Craddock. But and I think I think I'm Paul (laughs) Pizzuti. And this is the Broadway Drumming One on One podcast. (laughs) And thank you so much. I'm fortunate. Thank you so much for allowing me to change my mind so many times. Yes, I had to. I I had to like, like hunt him down. I was like. You know, on the bus, you know, in the back, and have my my binoculars looking. Is that Paul in the front? That's him. Yeah. Like, yeah. him. He's still alive. Okay, good. Maybe <laughs> take some contact here. No, but yeah. thank you for spending a couple hours with me, and it's it's just great to hear your story and yeah. and see how things have changed. And last story. Yes. Last. Well, yeah. This is fine. You can edit it. Brian Break. Break it down. I, I subbed for him at The Boy From Oz, mm. which was uh, Hugh Jackman story, solo story, a solo uh, act about Peter, uh, Peter, uh, the songwriter. Oh, my God. Peter, who's married to Liza Minnelli, mm. wrote Rio, you know, hey, my baby, my baby, follows me, I go to Rio. Oh, come on. He's Australian. I can't remember his last name. But Brian had me ask me to say Peter Allen. Peter Allen. Thank you. Mind is complete. So (laughs) Brian asked me to sew. And I don't remember the bass player. I don't. Dan McMillan was playing percussion. Brian's kit was a five piece kit. He had a wood block. He had two 18s, I think like a K, and an 18 Sabian that was like a not. A pristine model symbol. And he said, Well, I gotta crack it. It sounds fine. I don't need to, you know, get a put a good symbol in here. He just had this small kit. He sounded great. It was such a pleasure scene. And he said, Oh, yeah, at the beginning of the second act, we go on stage and we play with with Jackman. I said, You do what? He said, Yeah, and there's no music. We kind of just play whatever he has to play. <laughs> wow. So I played a few shows and I'm sure I got axed after a few shows, but it was a great experience playing the show. And my wife, just as an example of like, she said, you, you play in Boy From Oz tonight for the first time, aren't you? And I said, yeah, you don't seem that nervous. And I said, well, the song is just, it's just playing tunes and the, the band plays so great. And Brian, I, I, it's not that, you know, I, I I shouldn't say it's not that hard because Brian is Brian and I'm Paul. You know, I'm not Brian. And I don't have the experience Brian has playing so much out of the pit. Just something that that many people say, you got to bring, when you play Broadway, it's versions of the music that you're playing. Types of, an example of it. It's not the true music, but you got to know the true music to be able to play the Broadway version. You know, you got to know the real stuff well enough that you can deal with this or whatever and know what that person means and know what it means to the music. You know, it's like to play as much as possible and do as many things as possible is the most important thing, which, you know, I saw your Latin thing. You don't, there's a little thing about Latin. I got to get into this or whatever. You had a, a video of some Latin band playing in the Bronx or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great thing. I, I, the little bit I've done of that with the real people, it like, oh, that's what that means. Or, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, not that I can do it well, but it's the familiarity with some of that stuff. So good. And I'm sure your tabla playing is really amazing, too. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) I'm working on it. All right. All right. I think I think I'll stop. So Brian, sorry, he said he. uh, Great. You were great. I forgot you you were about to say something about Brian. but I can't remember what you were going to say. I don't know. Other than the fact that it was a pleasure watching him play. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a pleasure watching him play. And I remember oh one time. He's doing the revival of uh, of uh, Chorus Line, and he was mm-hmm. doing something at one of the, you know, there were those Broadway plays 
Broadway on, on Broadway and Broadway concerts. Mm -hmm. And he was doing something. And he sat down at the drum set. And I'm looking at the part. And it says something like woodblock. And he just does a knock on the side of the snare. You know, the, the, the cross stick thing. And it's like, he doesn't even care whether it's a woodblock or not. That's fine. I mean, it sounds like a woodblock. It sounds perfect. And the groove was perfect. It was like, I don't know, remember what tune it was. But it was like, I love listening to him. I love listening to him. You know, he, he you know, he just makes the drums come alive, man. I wish so I many could people see do. him play. Yeah, I, I well, love to yeah. hear him talk because he we yeah. talked for four hours and just wow hearing his stories. Wow, it's just well, this is this has probably been about an hour and a half too long. So <laughs> you know, I hope you've got what you need, and yeah. you know, my daughter will be happy to listen to it. You know? Yes, this my is, wife said is... you should do it because Emma will want to hear it. Man, it's like okay, okay. Yeah, this is this is your life. This is the archive. <sighs> Archive of the Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I lo I'd love to hear the section. And we didn't do any more about, about endorsements or anything, but he doesn't have any. Okay, <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my Ableton shops are unable. You know, it's like yeah, great interviews of the other people. I mean, I, I haven't listened to the Merendino interview yet, but Selickson, Warren, Sean, yeah, Ray, it's just it's it, it's great, Clayton. This is great, man. There's dozens you know? more coming. I, 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 there's so <laughs> many people I've already talked to, and there's so many people that I want to talk to, like Larry. Well, Oop. yeah, Larry, I gotta get Larry on the phone. He, he already agreed. But it's just a matter it. of uh, setting up a time and and nailing yeah. things down because. Schedules yeah. are all crazy now, but we're dealing with psychos like me. <laughs> <laughs> He'll do it. He won't do it. He'll do it. He won't do it. <laughs> oh, next Friday. Uh, so you're playing the show. Your show started this Tuesday, right? Starting next next Saturday, October sixteenth. Ah, uh, we're in rehearsals now. Okay, okay. Well, if you're in town on the fifteenth, I don't know how late you're going to be rehearsing. Is it going to be late to eleven o'clock? Fifteenth, we oh. have a. Uh, 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 invited dress. Invited dress. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, but I, I'm I'm doing that thing at West End again with mm. uh, the the band from eight to ten though. Uh, eight yeah. to ten. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well not that not that I would want you to come see me play. God I'd forbid. Love to see you play. <laughs> it would be you, you, yeah. I mean, it's 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 interesting. Uh, mm. So <laughs> how's my how's your career? It's interesting. It's been interesting. <laughs> Well, All right, man. Paul, thank you very, very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I I appreciate the, the, the call and I appreciate your patience in no. listening to me talk no, and in allowing great. me to do this. Really, Clayton. Thank you. I will see you soon. Okay. And uh, enjoy your semi retirement because I know you're back playing and Yeah. It, it's it's still it, it's it's hard it's like, to stop it's like the mafia it's like the mafia exactly <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right i'll talk to you soon take care clayton thank you bye-bye right. goodbye